Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Succession Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the Bill as amended at Stage 2, SP Bill 75A, the Marshalled List, SP Bill 75AML revised, and the Groupings, SP Bill 75AG revised. The Division Bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. And the voting period after that will be 30 seconds. Um, thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any of the groups of amendments should please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. And I would be grateful if members could now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. Group 1 is survivorship, and I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister, which is grouped with Amendments 7, 9 and 10, and I ask the Minister to move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group. Please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, currently under the Succession Scotland Act 1964, Section 31 provides that in a common calamity, the younger person is regarded as surviving the older. As recommended by the Scottish Law Commission, Section 9 of the Bill replaces these presumptions with a new survivorship provision. Section 9 of the Bill provides that in a common calamity, neither person is presumed to have survived the other. We have identified a small number of statutory provisions that need to be brought into line with new fail-to-survive terminology to ensure that they work properly. These are provisions that allow direct descendants to inherit if a child predeceases a parent. Under the existing law, those sections are not relevant to a parent or child uh, common calamity because the child, as a younger person, would always be regarded as surviving the parent. Dr David Nicholls from the Law Society of Scotland highlighted the tension between Section 6 and Section 9 through the following example. A father leaves the residue of his estate to his daughter, and then both father and daughter die in circumstances where the order of death is uncertain. Section 9 says that the daughter fails to survive her father, but her children cannot inherit under Section 6 because the daughter did not die before the date of vesting. A similar point arises in Sections 5, 6 and 11 uh, of the, section, uh, the Succession Scotland's 1964 Act, which rely on the primary beneficiary predeceasing. These amendments therefore replace the references to predecease in those sections with fail to survive, so that all of the provisions of the Bill and the 1964 Act are in line with and get the benefit of the new survivorship provision in Section 9 of the Bill. Direct descendants of a child will therefore be able to take that child's share of an estate should the child and the parent die in a common calamity. I note that Trust Bar gave written evidence to the committee about these amendments, which they acknowledge were given without the benefit of the sight of the actual amendments. I hope they are reassured by the focus of the amendments on the terminology used in survivorship provisions. I move Amendment 1. Many thanks. As no other member has requested to speak in this group, Minister, would you like to wind up? Thank you. The question then is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I then move us to Group 2, Executors, and I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister, which is grouped with Amendments 3, 4, 5, 5A, 5B, 6 and 7. Sorry, 6 and 8. And I ask the Minister to move Amendment 2 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, currently, all executors' dative, except spouses whose prior rights exhaust an estate, are required to find a uh, cation. An executor dative is appointed by the court, usually because there is no will to administer an, an, an estate. The Scottish Law Commission recommended that the statutory requirement placed on executors' dative to obtain the bond of, of cation should be abolished. A bond of cation is an insurance policy that protects the beneficiaries and creditors from loss caused by maladministration, negligence or fraud. The Scottish Law Commission made this recommendation on the basis of the financial and administrative burden they create and the current difficulties which exist in obtaining bonds of cation, the cost, the limited number of providers, delays in issuing cation and the conditions which providers sometimes attach to the bond. We consulted on the abolition of bonds of cation along with the other provisions which are in this bill and there was support for the abolition but it was clear that some alternative safeguards would be needed at least in some circumstances so we indicated that we would not abolish bonds of cation without further consultation on the safeguards. The bill as introduced therefore did not include any provision on bonds of cation. However, since that decision was made, one of the two institutional providers of cation, uh, Zurich, are to stop issuing bonds of cation to executors from the 1st of February uh, 2016. The only other provider of cation is Royal Sun Alliance, but they require a solicitor to be appointed in each case. Zurich does not. This will impact adversely on estates that can currently be wound up without the involvement of a solicitor. 
in particular under Section 3 of the Intestates, uh, Widows and Children Scotland Act 1875, confirmation is uncontentious, uh, in uncontentious small estates, currently under £36,000, being applied for under a simplified procedure in which the Sheriff Clerk prepares the inventory and takes the, the oath. This supported process means that an executor dative does not have to engage a solicitor unless he or she wishes to do so, which means that the estate uh, does not have to bear legal costs. In order to minimise the impact of the change in the cation market with the attendant costs on uncontentious small estates, Amendment 2 amends the Intestates Widows and Children Scotland Act 1875 and the Confirmation of Executors Scotland Act 1823 to remove the requirement for executors' datives in these estates to find cation. The amendment expressly provides that it will apply to ongoing applications which have not been determined by the time the change comes into force. Amendment 3, uh, uh, I'll turn to Amendment 3, Section 2 of the uh, Confirmation of Executors Scotland Act 1823 requires cation to be found in all cases except where there is an executor nominate or the executor dative is the uh, intestate spouse and has right by virtue of Sections 8 and 9, Subsection 2 of the Succession Scotland Act 1864 to the whole estate. Civil partners have the same rights under the 1964 Act, but are still required uh, to find cation. Amendment 3 extends a spousal exemption to civil partners whose prior rights under Section 8 and 9, Subsection 2 of the Succession Scotland Act 1964 exhaust the whole estate. Amendment 3 also provides powers to Scottish ministers to modify Section 2 of the Confirmation of Executive Scotland Act 1823 to add to the cases in which cation is not required to be found. Having only one provider of cation is undesirable, and whilst the remaining provider has given us assurances that it has no intention of withdrawing from the market, we are not able to say what business decisions the remaining provider may make in the future. We therefore needed a solution to deal with the possibility of the remaining provider withdrawing. Otherwise, we will be in a position where a bond of cation is required as a matter of law before confirmation can be granted, but there is no ability to obtain that bond of cation. Uh, given the uncertainty of the future landscape, we need potentially to be able to deal with a range of matters. Amendment 4 therefore provides a power for Scottish Ministers to abolish the requirement for cation altogether. Amendments 5, uh, 5A and 5B are not what I turn to now. In light of that uncertainty, and in order to ensure that we can deal with the fullest range of situations in the most appropriate way, including the issues raised in the consultation in relation to the need for safeguards, Amendment 5 provides broad powers for ministers to be able to make regulations setting out conditions which must be met uh, before courts may appoint an executor dative. These conditions might include the court being satisfied that the person is suitable for appointment, that the court is to be provided with particular information about the person seeking appointment or about the estate. These regulations may apply to all executor dative appointments or to particular types of executor dative. If the regulations make provision that requires the court to determine the suitability of an executor dative, the regulations may set out factors or information which the courts should have regard to in determining if the person is suitable for appointment, that the court should be satisfied that the individual is suitable if certain conditions are met, or to allow or require the court to impose its own conditions which must be satisfied before a person is suitable for appointment. Uh, and to provide further flexibility, the regulations uh, may make different provision for different types of executor dative. I'd like to acknowledge the helpful suggestions made by Ailey Scobie at the evidence session this week. We have taken on board her comment in relation to this amendment, as set out in the manuscript amendments 5A and 5B, which are intended to make clear uh, the intention of this provision. Amendment 6 provides that regulations made in exercise of the powers under uh, Amendments 3, 4 and 5 may include supplementary, incidental, consequential, transitional, transitory or savings provision as required and will be subject to the affirmative procedure. The regulations may also modify enactments, and where regulations are made to abolish the requirement for cation, the regulations may modify the act resulting from this bill itself. For example, if the requirement for cation was abolished completely, the power to make exceptions would no longer be necessary and would be repealed. Amendment 8 provides that amendments 2 to 6 come into force on the day after royal assent, and this is to minimise any delays in confirmation that might be caused by Zurich's withdrawal. By virtue of the specific wording in Amendment 2, the abolition of the requirement of cation will apply in relation to any applications under the proceeding uh, applying to small intestate estates which have not been determined before the amendments come into force. The Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service has assured us that the small gap between withdrawal of Zurich and the coming into force of the amendments can be managed by them administratively. We did, of course, look at a number of alternatives, from doing nothing to making wholesale changes in relation to bonds of cation, but the former option, uh, for the reasons I've already outlined, would not have been an acceptable option, and complete reform is neither practical or possible, given that there were many issues raised in response to our first consultation which have yet to be addressed with the benefit of our second consultation. Nor would emergency legislation be an ideal option, given these amendments are within the scope of this bill. 
While considering the evidence, the committee asked if we had considered a state-funded alternative to bonds of cation provided by insurers and pointed to the possible model of the guarantee provided by the Keeper of Registers of Scotland. Uh, when registering an application, the Keeper will warrant to the applicant that the title sheet is accurate. The Keeper may be liable to pay compensation to the applicant where the title sheet is inaccurate and the inaccuracy is rectified. This is the state guarantee of title which was continued under the Land Registration uh, etc. Scotland Act 2012. Registers of Scotland operates as a trading fund and are entirely self-funded. This ensures flexibility to manage their income and expenditure. And given the funding position and the involvement of the Keeper in the registration process, we do not think this is a model which could translate in protecting beneficiaries and creditors uh, from maladministration by an executor. And a key difference is that in the Keeper's guarantee uh, is that it is an applicant for registration who is compensated, not a third party relying on the register. Overall, therefore, I do not believe uh, that this is a desirable solution. But apart from existing legal impediments, there would be, in any case be uh, many considerations around budget and potential state aid tests which would need to be resolved. I, I move Amendment 2, uh, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Nigel Dawn. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And it's strange for the Convener of Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee to be on his hind legs for uh, Stage 3, but I'd like to briefly address the processes in examining these amendments because I think they are instructive. Um, as the Minister has highlighted, this has all come upon us rather suddenly, and it, it was only on Tuesday the 19th, just over a week ago, that officials came to brief us about the need to look at these. At that point, my committee decided they would like some evidence on what was being proposed, and I'm grateful to the clerks, who I think should be mentioned in dispatches, for the speed with which they managed to put together the um, panel who addressed us this Tuesday, the 26th. Uh, as the Minister has commented, Ailey Scobie, who's a partner in Burnett and Reed LLP in Aberdeen, came down. Uh, we also had Dr. Dot Reed from the University of Glasgow and John Kerrigan, who's a partner in Morrison's LLP and represented the Law Society of Scotland. And they gave us a, a fascinating uh, uh, insight into how they saw this. They provided a great deal of reassurance. They raised one or two questions, which the Minister, I am grateful uh, for answering now. The, several of the things that came up have just, just been addressed. Uh, and as the Minister has mentioned, Eddie Scobie uh, specifically mentioned a couple of amendments which have come through as amendments 5A and 5B. I'm grateful to the presiding officer for accepting those in manuscript. I think, presiding officer, I, I'm saying this simply because it does demonstrate that this Parliament is capable of being very swift on its feet when we are forced to do so. I'm grateful, as I say, to everybody involved, particularly to the witnesses who came across Scotland to be here, uh, to the forbearance of my clerks and, and my committee for ensuring that we have a great deal of reassurance about what's before the Chamber today. Thank you. Thank you. John Scott. No, thank you, presiding officer. And I just want to say, uh, too, that we welcome this group of amendments precipitated by the withdrawal of the Zurich Insurance Company who provided bonds of cation. I uh, also welcome the Minister's comments today, and as Mr Don has already said, uh, some of his comments indeed address the outstanding uh, questions that were perhaps left hanging in the air uh, at, when our committee last met on Tuesday. I think the Government did the correct thing by introducing these amendments, and we as a committee were all reassured that our expert witnesses agreed with us. However, we are also aware of the very tight timescale that evidence taking and drafting of these amendments has been compressed into, and, and should uh, they have unforeseen consequences, we are aware that the next succession bill will hopefully come before Parliament in the next session of Parliament. And should these amendments turn out to be deficient in some way, then their process uh, could be looked at again at that time. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. There appear to be three ways uh, in which wills can be dealt with. Uh, one, there is uh, an executor or executrix uh, nominate, in other words, decide of the person uh, whose will it is. Uh, there is uh, where an executor has to be appointed, and we have an executor or executive dative. And the overwhelming majority of cases uh, where there's no confirmation whatsoever, most uh, wills, it, w most uh, estates are wound up informally. And I think the whole issue that we're discussing in this group is about where people uh, have died in teste or uh, where the executor that they've nominated is not available and we have to go for uh, one that the court essentially appoints. And I think if there's one message comes out of this, uh, presiding officer, that I hope people will read, 
All of this will not touch you at all if you make a will. Now, I'm not giving legal advice, but apparently a will can be as short as nine word, eh, ten words. It can be, I appoint X as executive. I leave everything to Y. So it's not difficult to do. Please, everyone, get a bit of paper, write it down, make sure somebody's got the bit of paper, and then none of this complication will touch what happens after you die. I'm happy to support what the Minister's proposal. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite you to wind up? I'm, I'm fine. Thank you, President Officer. In which case, the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. I therefore now call Amendments 3, 4, 5, 5A, 5B and 6 to 10, who are all in the name of the Minister and all have been previously debated. And I invite the Minister to move Amendments 3, 4, 5, 5A, 5B and 6 to 10 on block, please, Minister. Uh, formally moved on block. Many thanks. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 3 to 10? Since no member objects, then the question is that Amendments 3, 4, 5A, 5B, 5 and 6 to 10 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And that then ends consideration of amendments and brings us to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 15440 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on the Succession Scotland Bill. Before I invite the Minister to open the debate, can I call on the Cabinet Secretary to signify Crown consent to the Bill, please, Michael Matheson. Officer, for the purposes of Rule 9.11 of the Standing Orders, I wish to advise the Parliament that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purports of the Succession Scotland Bill, has consented to place her prerogative and interests, so far as they are affected by the Bill, at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That means we now begin the debate. Can I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Paul Wheelhouse to speak to and to move the motion. Minister, nine minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It gives me great pleasure to open the Stage 3 debate on the Succession Scotland Bill and to invite members to agree to pass the Bill uh, this evening. At the outset, I thank members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their hard work and careful scrutiny of essentially a technical bill in which they have done the Parliament great credit. Uh, and I thank MSPs for their comments on it during the passage through the Parliament and the organisations and individuals who provided oral and written, written evidence to the committee. Uh, as, as Nigel Dawn indicated, I also uh, congratulate the, the clerks to the committee as well for their support. In particular, I would like to thank um, the uh, Law Society of Scotland and Trust Bar who have been generous in giving of their time and expertise as we have developed the legislative proposals and indeed all the witnesses who have uh, supported the process. Of course, I would also like to thank the Scottish Law Commission for their stinting patients as we sought their advice and recommendations they had published over six years ago. Um, that's not a point not lost on me and I'm sure not lost on, on my colleagues across the chamber. Their advice and views have been invaluable though and I, I said at the outset that this bill was essentially technical and it is but what became clear through the scrutiny process is that the provisions have the potential to impact on any one of us at an especially vulnerable time in our lives. Ensuring that the bill fulfills the policy aims of making the law and succession fairer, clearer, more consistent is therefore especially important. These are, after all, the first significant amendments to the law of succession in over 50 years. Uh, as I indicated during the Stage 1 debate, the Bill has its origins in the Scottish Law Commission's report on succession, published in 2009, and this is the second Bill to be considered as part of the SLC Bill procedure. I would like to take the opportunity to place on record once more my view that this, the process that is in place to scrutinise these bills is clearly effective in doing the important job of getting good law reform into statute and we can have confidence in the process going forward. The bill has been welcomed by the profession and will make a number of important improvements to the law. Currently, if a will makes provision for a spouse or civil partner, this remains valid even after the breakdown of the relationship, whether by divorce, dissolution or annulment. For many, this is an unexpected outcome and could lead to undesirable consequences, and this bill reverses that aspect of the law. There is currently no way of a person seeking rectification of a will to enable it to be corrected if it does not accurately express the testator's instructions. 
This deficiency in the law was highlighted by a case in the Supreme Court, Marley v. Rawlings and another, where Mr and Mrs Rawlings signed mirror wills leaving everything to each other, but if the other had already died, the entire estate was left to Mr Marley, who was not related to them, but whom they treated as their son. <coughs> However, due to a clerical error, Mr Rawlings signed the will prepared for Mrs Rawlings and vice versa. The sons of Mr and Mrs Rawlings challenged the validity of the will on the basis that they could inherit under the laws of intestacy. However, the Supreme Court decided that Mr Rawlings' will should be rectified. Excuse me, presiding officer. Uh, <clears throat> However, as this was an English case, there was uncertainty about what decision the Scottish courts would have reached, and the bill will address this issue. <clears throat> Similarly, someone might not expect that if you make a new will and then change your mind and cancel the new will, any earlier will revise and dictates how your estate will be distributed. Again, this is unlikely to be what you intended. This bill will reverse this position so an earlier will is not revived by the revocation of a later will. This does not prevent the individual reviving the will by other means, such as by re-executing the will or making a new will in the same terms. The only exception is where there is express provision to the effect that an earlier will is revived, as then it will be clear that this is the individual's intention. The opportunity has also been taken to close a number of jurisdictional gaps to ensure that Scottish courts have jurisdiction where the applicable law is Scots law. <clears throat> we touched on some of the issues around how survivorship should operate in Scotland when we debated the, the stage three amendments just now. Whilst common calamities are not everyday occurrences, we need to have clarity and certainty in the law where there is uncertainty as to the order of death, and the Bill uh, achieves this. The Bill has also swept away some very old legislation through the repeal of the Parasite Act 1594 uh, and reform of the law relating to forfeiture. The notorious Dr Crippen was found guilty of murdering his wife Cora. He inherited from his wife, and as he sat in jail waiting his, awaiting his fate of hanging, he wrote a will leaving his estate to his mistress. The judge said, however, that it is clear that the law is, no per is that no person can obtain or enforce any right resulting to him from his own crime, and Dr Kip Crippen was thus subject to the law of forfeiture. Forfeiture is where an individual loses a right to inherit because they have unlawfully killed their benefactor. At the moment, while such an individual would lose any rights to inherit the way they are treated in the eyes of law, also dictates how any inheritance would be distributed to others, and we have therefore made changes to ensure that the law is fair and more consistent in that respect. The Bill also reforms estate administration by putting in place protections for trustees and executors in certain circumstances and for persons acquiring title in good faith and reforms other matters which would include the abolition of um, donations mortis causa and the right to claim the expense of mornings. It will have been clear that the Scottish Government has listened carefully to the views of both stakeholders and the committee, which is why at stage two of the Bill process we made a number of changes to the Bill. Excuse me. In succession law, someone must survive to inherit, and equally, sometimes, for another person to inherit, it must be clear that the person on whom their inheritance is conditional has died before the testator. Failure to survive does not necessarily mean that a person can be regarded as dying before another person. A person who fails to survive the testator may have died at the same time as them. At stage two, we therefore made a number of changes to ensure that where needed to achieve the policy objectives, it's clear that a person died before another person. And earlier today, we made some further small related amendments to ensure that there are no un unintended consequences of surpri or surprising outcomes and that the detail is unambiguous. We debated earlier some unanticipated amendments to the bill, which arose out of the business decision of one of the providers of bonds of cation to withdraw from the market. We had, in a very short space of time, as Nigel Dawn said, to consider the impact of this decision and take action to try and mitigate the worst effects of it. I am very grateful to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service for highlighting the problem in the first place and for working with us to get to the best possible remedy, given the many constraints we were under. Once again, the Law Society were able to offer their views under, thank you, under significant time pressures and provide the necessary reassurances on the remedy. Not least, the committee demonstrated their capacity to take quick evidence and arrive at a view. I very much appreciate the additional scrutiny that the evidence session provided and the input of witnesses already uh, who attended the committee. It gives me great, uh, even greater confidence going forward that the solution we provided for will address an immediate situation and give us the capacity to insulate against any f further change which is beyond our control. We will be turning again to the reform of bonds of cation, as uh, John Scott indicated, as part of the wider and more fundamental reform of the law of succession. And I will continue to uh, reflect on a number of the suggestions made at the earlier evidence session, which are more appropriate to any further consideration of bonds of cation. 
Voting for the Succession Scotland Bill today will ensure that some long overdue reform is made to a very important area of the law. It is an area that at some point, or indeed points in our life, we will all come into contact with in one form or another. It is therefore vitally important that the law meets expectations and is fit for purpose. And I believe these reforms will achieve that aim, presiding officer. Therefore, I do move that the Succession Scotland Bill will be passed. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Elaine Murray. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. During the Stage 2 consideration of amendments, the Minister for Community Justice stated that he was glad to get away from the Justice Committee uh, for a while. Uh, I suspect that fellow members of the Justice Committee will agree with me that we were pleased not to have this bill in front of our committee, uh, along with all the others. And indeed, we are grateful to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for doing the hard work on this very technical bill. The downside of the bill not having come to the Justice Committee is that yet again I am required to provide an opening speech on a bill with which I have very little familiarity and indeed I would not care to try to uh, pass an exam on the set of amendments we've just been discussing. I felt probably if they had been discussed in Latin I would be about as well uh, educated in, in terms of their effect. The, the bill does, of course, deal with issues of importance to the majority of people, wills and inheritance. And I note that at stage two, the Minister brought forward a number of amendments to clarify some of the issues raised at stage one, and, and had, indeed has done so again today. As stated previously, it is based on a draft bill produced by the Scottish Law Commission, but it does not uh, include all the provisions of the draft bill. The other provisions will undergo further consultation. Indeed, may still actually be undergoing consultation at this time with a view to further legislation in the next Parliament, and I'm sure that everybody looks forward to that. Uh, the issue of guardianship has been addressed. The concerns highlighted by the Law Society that a will, for example, appointing a person's spouse or civil partner as a guardian of their stepchildren will continue to take effect if the relationship is terminated and the deceased has not made a subsequent arrangement. This amendment was necessary because the bill revokes an existing, a person's existing will and divorce or dissolution of a civil partnership, as we've discussed. If amended, the former partner would not be able to become the child's guardian, even if the deceased would have wanted that arrangement to continue. The bill now also makes it clear that the revocation of a will does not apply when the testator died prior to the annulment of the marriage or civil partner taking, uh, partnership taking place. And I, think, I suppose that's a bit of a technical uh, issue, but I suppose it could be that uh, there, there could be a, the odd occasion where somebody has died before the whole process has gone through. The, the Law Society of Scotland stated in their written evidence that Section 1 should apply when the testator died do domiciled in Scotland or had heritable property in Scotland. The bill originally applied to persons permanent residents in Scotland when they died, and the committee received a variety of responses to the section at Stage 1. The committee at that stage agreed with the government's approach, however both were persuaded by the Law Society's arguments. The Minister explained to the committee that, this, that succession to a movable estate is governed by something called lex situs or where the population is, uh, pop property is uh, situated. Succession to movable property depends on where the deceased was domiciled at the time of their death, and the bill has therefore been amended so that Section 1 applies where the testator was not domiciled in Scotland, but did own her heritable property here. The bill enables courts to rectify a will after the death of the testator so that simple and obvious errors can be corrected with the proviso that someone other than the testator had prepared the will and the testator had issued instructions to that person. There was some discussion at stage one whether this should be ex extended to wills uh, prepared by the testator, for example, handwritten wills or wills produced uh, using an online template. The Scottish Law Commission draft bill on which this bill is based enabled, sorry, the, the committee and the minister resisted these arguments and probably quite uh, correctly. The Scottish uh, Law Commission draft bill on which the bill is based enabled the sheriff in the sheriffdom where the will was confirmed to consider an application for activation. rectification. This was not included in the bill as introduced. An amendment at stage two now corrects that inadvertent omission. The bill puts into statute the common law provision that when a beneficiary predeceases the testator, the beneficiary's direct descendants should inherit. The policy intention has been clarified by amendment at stage two, and the bill now en enables a testator to identify a beneficiary by category, such as their relationship to the testator, as well as by, na uh, by name, and this was a committee recommendation at stage one. The bill addresses a situation where two people who are each other's beneficiaries die at the same time, or it is unclear which person died first. If they had been in a legal partnership, spouses or civil partners, the 1964 Act presumes that neither survived, and therefore both partners' subsequent beneficiaries will inherit. 
However, if the two people were not involved in a legal partnership, the law as it stands at present assumes that the younger person survived the older person and therefore only the younger person's beneficiaries will inherit. The bill, however, didn't address the, uh, the issue of a col common cal calamity, and there's been some discussion again at stage three on that. For example, where an entire family died in an accident and there were no surviving beneficiaries, in which case the estate would go to the Crown rather than to any surviving uh, rel uh, relatives. Clarifying this uh, situation is complex, and the amendments at both stage three, two and stage three set out conditions where property may transfer to one member of the group depending on the order of death. The, uh, the bill sets in statute of the forfeiture rule, which precludes a person who is unlawfully killed from, benefit of nothing, uh, from benefiting from the result. And indeed, the Minister has uh, illustrated that as it is for us to deal with the example of Crippen. Um, in such cases, the person who has forfeited their right to the estate by an unlawful killing will be considered, for the purposes of inheritance law, to have failed to, sur to survive the testator. A stage two amendment clarified that forfeiture included legal and prior rights. Uh, I'll take that as spoken because I'm quite uncertain personally as to what actually uh, that means, but I'm sure it's probably uh, a good thing. The bill also abolishes something ter termed donations in mortis causa as a particular legal entity, again, something I had never heard of. Uh, a person can make a gift, or as it sounds, can make a gift to another in the anticipation that they are going to die. But if they don't die, the gift can be returned to them. And the, uh, the donor can also change their mind and ask for it back. And there's, if the recipient dies first, the gift is returned to the donor rather than the recipient's beneficiaries. This does seem to be a rather curious sort of uh, gift. And uh, you know, one wonders how it ever arose in the first place. Um, however, they, it is abolished as a legal entity by this bill, although indeed gifts can still be made on this basis, but do not require to be in anticipation of death. As I say, it seems curious that somebody thinking they were going to die would make a gift and then decide they wanted it back just because they didn't die. But anyway, uh, the bill, as I said, is a very technical bill, uh, and uh, I'm sure that it's, it's will be of great benefit to uh, the, the future understanding of, of inheritance uh, and I'm sure we all look forward to whatever comes, back, comes forward in the next session which will uh, build on, on the, the provisions of this bill today. Thank you. I now call on John Scott. Four minutes please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome uh, today's Stage 3 proceedings on the Succession Bill and as the Bill completes its parliamentary passage this afternoon, I would once again like to thank the witnesses and stakeholders who have helped to inform the legislative process thus far, as well as the Scottish Law Commission for the considerable work it has undertaken to see these reforms to completion. I'd also like to thank our DPLR committee clerks and our legal advisors too, who have worked above and beyond the call of duty. In particular, I pay tribute to the witnesses who gave evidence for the second time to the DPLR committee on the Scottish Government's amendments on bonds of cation at very short notice this week. As members will be aware, this was an unusual step at stage three and breaks new ground for our committee, if not for the Parliament. Previously, the Scottish Government had decided to exclude bonds of cation from the scope of the bill, despite their abolition being one of the Scottish Law Commission's recommendations in its 2009 report, on which many of the bill's provisions are based. This was primarily because there was a lack of consensus surrounding the nature of the safeguards that would have been required in the event of abolition. The prospect of a second piece of legislation in relation to the succession law meant that there would have been a suitable vehicle to implement any changes in this area at a later date, allowing more time for inquiry and consultation on satisfactory safeguards. However, the Scottish Government's hand was forced by recent developments in which Zurich one of the two insurance providers of bonds of cation had announced uh, that it will withdraw from the market from the 1st of February, leaving the Royal Sun Alliance, as the Minister said, as the sole provider. And the key issue here is that the Royal Sun Alliance makes the provision of a bond of cation conditional on a solicitor being appointed to administer the estate, while Zurich did not. This has caused implications for small estates with a gross value of less than 36,000, which currently benefit from the simplified small estate procedure. As we know, the Scottish Government introduced amendments at stage three to mitigate the effects of the recent changes in the market, and I was keen to explore the implications of these changes with witnesses earlier this week. However, evidence from all our witnesses indicated that the Scottish Government's course of action in response to the withdrawal of Zurich, although a quick fix, is both proportionate and fair. 
So based on the evidence we heard, it seems that this course of action was the correct one, particularly given the glacial pace at which legislation on succession law has historically been introduced and the uncertainty generated in the immediate future by the forthcoming election. I would also echo the view of the DPLR committee convener, Nigel Dawn, that these measures are not retrospective but transitional because we are doing it now for the future, but only until we get to the next gate. And under such circumstances, it is incumbent on the successor DPLR committee and the parliament to undertake robust scrutiny of what can reasonably be described as stopgap measures over the coming months and years as a clearer picture of the situation on the ground emerges. And on that basis, we in the Scottish Conservative Party were content to support these amendments. Presiding officer, from the outset, the DPLR committee's scrutiny of the bill has been collaborative and consensus driven. From a policy perspective, the majority of the bill's provision are non-contentious and the legal profession has been strongly supportive of reform, particularly given that the Scottish Law Commission's first report on succession law, on which the 2009 report is based, was published in 1990, almost three decades ago. I am therefore pleased that many of the SLC's recommendations, which are broadly technical in nature, are being placed on the statutory footing today and confirm that the Scottish Conservatives will support this bill at decision time. Thank you. Perfectly timed. <laughs> we now turn to the open debate. Uh, speeches of four minutes, please, and I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Margaret McTrickle. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm glad that uh, extending the remit of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, has created additional parliamentary capacity for uh, dealing with bills uh, that essentially come from the Scottish Law Commission. By their nature, of course, SLC bills address matters where they have established there is broad uh, agreement on remedies for errors, omissions uh, and updating existing uh, legislation. Uh, our taking of evidence and our discussions around the Succession Scotland Bill have been interesting and, for me at least, uh, informative. Um, but given that we all die, um, I'm sure that this is a piece of law that will ultimately touch us all uh, in the disposal of our assets or our debts. Even those who have no assets and no debts cannot be assured they will escape uh, the provision of this bill. Now, the complexity and lack of agreement on some issues in succession is, of course, why a, a future government will have to grasp the nettle of a much more wide-ranging uh, restatement and reform. Uh, and Elaine Murray, if she is here to do so, uh, can look forward, if she is again on the Justice Committee, I'm sure, uh, to that pleasure. Now, personal circumstances illustrate some of this for me. My grandfather wrote his will handwritten and a mere 21 words. It said, I, David Berry, do appoint my granddaughter, Helen Mary Berry McGregor, my executive and bequeath to her my whole means and estate. So what can be that simple? Uh, the only trouble was when he wrote his will, my uh, mother, his granddaughter, whom he named, was then one. And when he died, she was then three. So she wasn't legally capable. She was legally uh, incapable. But the process, of course, meant that her father, who was administrator in law, uh, became the executive dative to replace my mother, who had been the executive nominate. Uh, so he, 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 he was appointed. Um, and so you can, you can do things in, in that particular way. Now, of course, I've also been touched uh, in winding up estates in another way, in, in just over 10 years ago, when a small estate of a, a, a relative uh, had to be wound up. No house was owned. It was simply some movable, movable effects. Uh, she had written a little handwritten will that said her two daughters were equally to receive uh, the, the proceeds, and simply that was uh, done informally. There was no confirmation. Now, through the passage of this bill, uh, I can tell you now, presiding officer, that I have apparently become and remain a vicious intromitter, meaning that because we didn't go through this formal process, I, for the rest of my natural life, will remain liable for any errors I committed in winding up that little estate um, and not getting confirmation. And yet, of course, 
the vast majority of the states, small estates, are dealt with on that basis. And I think that illustrates uh, some of the things uh, which may be engaged uh, next time we look at this uh, very uh, complex area. Delighted we're getting rid of the Parasite Act of 1594 um, because we've invented the legal fiction in the courts um, that if someone is responsible for the death of someone from whom they're going to uh, inherit, because the Parasite Act is quite narrow, it's father and son, um, that uh, the legal fiction is that the person who would have inherited is deemed, notwithstanding they're still breathing and consuming food and so on and so forth, they are legally dead before the person whose death they were responsible for. Now, that works in uh, proper terms, but it's a bit, uh, a bit cack-handed, so it's a good idea uh, really to do close, some things. Please. And the final thing, uh, presiding officer, is we had a huge and interesting discussion about uh, common calamities and sequencing of death. And the important thing is we worked out a way of which you can be certain that you're uncertain and therefore the rules about uncertainty could be applied. But of course, only when you're certain, you're uncertain. Presiding officer. Thank you. I must ask your next two members to keep very tightly to the four minutes, please. Margaret McDougall to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, presiding officer. And I thank uh, Stuart Stevenson for that educational um, talk he's just given us, as usual. Um, as the Minister said, the succession bill is mainly a technical bill, and I understand, uh, and I've heard today, that the, it's part of the wider-ranging reforms that are to be made during the next parliamentary term. In effect, the succession bill is an exercise in tidying parts of the law in advance of further consultation and further policy reform. That said, during Stage 1 at the committee, the Scottish Law Commission said that this description should not in any way be seen as diminishing the importance or effect of the Bill's provisions. Indeed, for those who find themselves in situations to which the Bill's provisions apply, they are likely to be highly important. The changes being made to the law of succession are to be welcomed, as it both modernises the law of succession and brings us more in line with England on some of these matters. I have often found it odd that even after the breakdown of a relationship that the spouse, if mentioned in the will, would be entitled to assets. The succession bill alters this so that in the event of divorce, disillusion or annulment, unless otherwise stated by the testator, the favourable status of a former spouse is revoked. The same would now be true if the former spouse was appointed as a guardian of the child. This shift now means that Scotland and England have broadly similar positions on the issue. This, in my view, is to be welcomed. The changes to survivorship in the event of common calamities is, in my view, a sensible change. Currently, the rules state that in the event of a spouse dying close to each other, the younger spouse is presumed to have survived the elder. Section 9 of the Succession Bill changes this so that when two people die in these circumstances, neither is to be treated as having survived the other. So in terms of fatal car crashes and other events of this nature, these changes make sense. Finally, one part of the current bill I'm seeking clarity on is that of Section 6. Section 6 makes provision to deal with the situation when a deceased person's first choice of beneficiary in a will has died before them, and the will makes no provision for what should happen in this situation. Before the rule was unclear in terms of nieces and nephews, this has been tidied up to ensure that the rule is narrowed to include the testator's direct descendants only. However, I'm unclear what this means in cases where either there are no direct descendants or the direct descendants have passed away before the will is actioned. Will assets then be Will assets then be passed to the nieces and nephews in the event of no direct descendants, unless otherwise stated in the will? <coughs> to conclude, presiding officer, I am happy to support the bill before us today. I believe the changes are sensible and provide a much needed update to succession law. The changes attempt to deal with some of the more confusing elements of earlier succession law. 
I understand that on the whole, while important, this is a technical piece of legislation and I look forward to seeing what role this bill plays in the wider ranging policy reform that is forthcoming. Thank you. Many thanks. And a brief contribution, please, from John Mason. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, obviously, because this uh, is a Scottish Law Commission bill and because it was being dealt with by the DPLR committee, it did not contain anything considered controversial, which is why we're having such a friendly and civilised debate uh, this afternoon. However, it has to be said we did get some fairly strong legal opinion on each side of some of the points. Uh, for example, as Elaine Murray already referred to, Section 1 uh, the, of the bill that states that uh, the section should take effect only when the deceased dies domiciled in Scotland. There was respected legal opinion to support that. However, there was also respected legal opinion supporting a change so that Section 1 would apply as long as the testator was domiciled in Scotland when the marriage or civil partnership ended. And then uh, brought in the question as to whether this should be looked at under matrimonial law or succession law. So there was real debate, uh, and I just give that as an example of that kind of debate that we had at the committee. Other subjects we considered included forfeiture and questions around the Forfeiture Act 1982. And this is the kind of point which will need to be looked at again. And the hope is that uh, these more serious uh, potential changes can be examined in a further succession bill before too long. Now, in the question of Cation and the amendments at stage three, I have to say I was pretty uneasy when I heard about this process. Other topics in the bill had been consulted to death, and this just seemed to appear out of nowhere. However, we took evidence on Tuesday, and I would also add my thanks to those involved who, who gave us the evidence and the support, and I have to say that I myself was much reassured by that process. The whole concept of abolishing the need for Cation had been consulted on and widely agreed upon at an earlier stage, and it was largely on practical grounds, as, as the Minister said, that it had not been included in the bill. But added, the added urgency of one of the two providers withdrawing from the market does make it sensible to deal with this at this time, and I'm happy to support the amended bill as it now stands. But I think the committee would want to stress, and I think actually the government probably agrees with this, that completely new amendments coming in at stage three it should not become a regular part of legislation. If I could make some general comments about the DPLR committee, eh, it's a very different committee from others in the Parliament. When you mention to fellow MSPs that you're a member of this committee, you tend to get various looks of either sympathy or humour. And I have to say I've questioned whether this committee should actually exist. It has not been unusual to have a lengthy briefing of an hour or so, followed by a very short and formal 10-minute meeting. Unlike other committees, MSPs are much more dependent on clerks and legal input, so that you have to wonder if MP MSPs add very much value. On this point, I can say how much I, and I think others, have appreciated the input of clerks, advisers and witnesses on this particular succession bill. I do not like asking questions I do not understand, but it was getting pretty close to that at times. So, but now the committee has looked at three bills and dealt with them, the Legal Writings Bill, Succession and coming up the Bankruptcy Consolidation. And I am somewhat more convinced that we do require a DPLR committee to exist. And I see no reason why its remit should not be further revised in the future. Death happens to us all, but we tend not to talk about it. And many of the public, and perhaps even some of ourselves, do not have wills. So while this is a very technical area of law, it is also a very practical one, which affects many people. Any encouragement to people to have wills and otherwise prepare for their departure has to be very welcome, and that was mentioned in our Stage 1 report. Mr. So Mason, I do very much support this bill becoming law, and I hope the Chamber will be able to do so unanimously. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. We now turn to closing speeches. A call on John Scott. Four minutes maximum, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank members for a good debate this afternoon, if controversial. Uh, from the outset, the Parliament passage of the Succession Bill has been characterised by consensus and collaboration, and that is testament to the DPLR Committee and the convivial but suitably robust approach it takes to the responsibilities that fall within its remit. I also pay tribute to the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and his officials who listened to the committee's recommendations at stage one and implemented those by way of amendments at stage two, which in turn received unanimous support from the members. The Minister also proactively liaised with the committee in relation to the stage three amendments on the bonds of Cation, which were unexpected but clearly necessary changes in light of the recent developments in the insurance market. I mentioned in my opening remarks that the bill is predominantly technical in nature, but as the SLC emphasised last year, 
This description should not in any way be seen as diminishing the importance or effect of the Bill's provisions. Indeed, for those who find themselves in situations to which the provisions apply, they are likely to be highly important. And Margaret McDougall noted that in, in her remarks, and they're worthy of repetition, as this is a compelling point. The Bill may be relatively limited in scope, with a focus on technical rather than substantive policy change, but it will still have a very significant impact on important areas of Scots law, implementing changes relating to wills, survivorship and forfeiture, as well as protections for executors, trustees and buyers of property. Let us not forget also that these reforms have been many years in the making, and I'm pleased that changes to the DPLR Committee's remit in 2013, touched on by John Mason, to consider certain bills emanating from SLC reports has helped to expedite some of the Commission's 2009 report recommendations being placed on the statutory footing. Perhaps in future, this change to the Committee's remit will mean that some of the less contentious reforms proposed by the SLC will be implemented more expeditiously and timorously. In this vein, I also commend the Scottish Government's approach of undertaking two separate projects on succession law. Although both are based on the SLC's 1990 and 2009 reports, this legislative report recommends itself well to areas of law where there are both technical and potentially controversial proposals. However, as we move forward, I would urge the Scottish Government to consider how it intends to consolidate the provisions in this bill and any future legislation that, come, that may come before the Parliament in the laws of succession. At stage one, I referred to the comments of Professor Joseph Thompson, the lead commissioner on the succession project, who said at the publication of the 2009 report, the aim is to simplify the law radically by providing rules which are easily understood and which at the same time reflect the nature of family structures in contemporary Scotland. At stage three, the test of this draft legislation remains whether it achieves the radical simplification intended by the SLC. The Scottish Conservatives are satisfi satisfied that this is indeed the case, and I reiterate my party's support for the bill at decision time. I would, however, end on a cautionary note, as others have, which is that the last-minute changes to the existing rules on the bonds of Cation must be subject to post-legislative scrutiny. While I am reassured that the Stage 3 amendments give Ministers a range of powers to future-proof against any further changes in the Cation market, I seek further assurances from the Minister that this is very much a live issue and that the Scottish Government will endeavour to monitor the developing situation and keep the Parliament suitably updated. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Graham Pearson. Maximum five minutes, Mr Pearson. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, it is my pleasure to present on behalf of Scottish Labour our support for the Government approach to the Succession Bill and the amendments that have been presented today. Uh, I think it right to thank Nigel Dawn and the other members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for the work that they have completed on behalf of this Parliament with such speed and such attention to detail. Indeed, the debate today was very helpful for me as someone not on that committee in understanding some of the complexities that they dealt with and then dealing with my somewhat confused uh, attitude today as to why it was suddenly presented at the last minute. And I now understand more clearly the approach that was taken. A number of uh, commentators in our debate this afternoon talked about the technical nature of the legislation we deal with today. Uh, and I'm grateful to uh, John Scott for uh, making comment that although it's been described as technical, it's nonetheless vitally important, uh, bearing in mind the impact it has on people's lives. Uh, and it seemed to me when I first received the paperwork for the succession bill that it seemed arcane, it seemed distant, and hardly relevant to day-to-day -day living. Uh, and for that reason, I think that Law Society and the Scottish Law Commission are to be complimented in the fact that they've maintained pressure on the government and this parliament to deal with the succession bill uh, and pay attention uh, that for six years they have waited patiently. Uh, having dealt with uh, a will myself in, in the last 18 months, uh, 
both as the executor and the person who benefited from it as a, an only child. It should have been a very simple process and one that I should have been able to cope with with ease. I've got to tell the Parliament I found it anything but simple and easy to deal with, and there was no conflict involved in that process. So the very technical issues that were described this afternoon are absolutely vital when it comes to people trying to deal with something they do not want to deal with and seek guidance on how to deal with it fairly and with equity, eh, particularly when there are some competing interests involved. I think we all know in this chamber families who have been split irretrievably in the, because of the outcome for the way in which someone's estate has been dealt with. And the succession bill does as best it can to try and avoid such splits for the future by offering some direct uh, guidance in the way uh, wills and matters of succession should be dealt with. I think that the approach that has been offered in, in terms of the validity of wills uh, post the breakdown in relationships by divorce, dissolution and annulment, particularly in the complex lives that we now live and the kinds of relations that, that we create uh, is absolutely vital. And I welcome the approach that the committee has endorsed and which we debate today. Uh, I also uh, note that like uh, buses in the city, uh, one bill comes along and before we know we're already suggesting there should be a second one. And I do think that that is important, that we have had something of a superficial examination of many of the issues uh, that have cropped up at, at speed. And the committee has done their best on behalf of this parliament to deliver. We need to check uh, in the new parliament that the deliverable outcomes are as we had wanted and any additional outcomes should be introduced in a bill that would come in our new parliament. So in conclusion, I don't seek to go through the detail of the bill. It's been rehearsed by many others with more clarity than I could bring. Uh, I do uh, welcome uh, protection for trustees and executors that have been commented on earlier. And I do think that the approach to succession forfeiture is much healthier than was previously the case. So in closing, I commend the approach of the committee and uh, would give confidence to the Minister of our support uh, when it comes to the vote. Thank you. Many thanks. And I call on Paul Wheelhouse to wind up the debate. Minister, if you could do so in less than seven minutes, I'd be most grateful. <laughs> It seems to have been met with uh, great, great acclaim from behind uh, the presiding officer. I would like to uh, I once again thank all members for their contributions to this debate and their interest in this uh, very important piece of legislation. It's a short debate, but I think the debate has demonstrated the importance of it, not least uh, Mr Pearson's own personal testimony about, you know, even a very simple scenario, distressing though it was, it should have been simple for, for that to be resolved. And I very much take to heart the point he has mentioned. I very much welcome the support that has been expressed for the reforms and I am grateful for the time that members have taken to engage with what at times could be a, a technically complex area of the law of succession. Our earlier debate on the Stage 3 amendments perhaps gave a flavour of the careful consideration that had to be given to the language and terminology in the Bill. The Bill has undoubtedly benefited from a willingness from stakeholders to participate fully in the development of the legislation and there has been little of any, indeed any, uh, disagreement about the need for these reforms and the process quickly became one of ensuring that the provisions met the aims of the reforms. And as my first experience of the process for Scottish Law Commission bills, I, I find it a very positive one for which, uh, again, I thank the committee and all the stakeholders who participated. I mentioned earlier that the health input from the professional representative bodies, and by way of example, the committee echoed in their stage one report the concern of trust bar that section nine of the bill had the potential to result in more estates falling to the crown. We sub subsequently enjoyed a helpful exchange with trust bar and we are confident that amendments we made to the bill at stage two address this point, even though it was not done in the way that trust bar suggested. Indeed, we had some concerns about the practicalities of trust bar's approach. 
nonetheless, the opportunity to enter into an informed discussion with stakeholders about various issues has undoubtedly enhanced our policy consideration and has contributed positively to the formation of the final provisions. I also mentioned earlier that this was the second bill uh, to be considered under the Scottish Law Commission procedure, and I think it's worth making the point that this bill is very different from the first, the, the Legal Writings Bill. The Scottish Law Commission's report was much older and we needed uh, to carry out our own consultation. Stage two for the Legal Writings Bill must have been one of the fastest on record with no amendments, uh, but this bill has had stage two and stage three amendments. And I have been struck by the willingness of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, led, as, as, as Nigel, uh, as, as uh, Graham Pearson indicated by Nigel Dawn, I very much thank Nigel Dawn for his uh, very positive and constructive approach he's taken to the sessions, committee sessions, and that's been reflected as in the attitude of other committee members, and including that Richard Baker, of course, who's moved on in this parliament. I thank him for his input too. Uh, but they were prepared to rearrange their schedule to accommodate late provisions, as others have said, and their responsiveness has greatly assisted the scrutiny process. I also share the committee's view that our laws need to be accessible, not just to the legal profession, but to the person in the street. And there were points made this week, even in the evidence session, about the need to give proper advice before people die, so advice about what to do before you die, rather than just advising those who are affected by a death in the family. And I've given an earlier undertaking to ensure that our guidance and websites are updated and user-friendly lay speak. And I would like to take the opportunity to reiterate that commitment today. The devil is in the detail and prob is probably a, an overused idiom, but I think it's very apt when talking about this bill. Most of us will have had some experience of being caught out by the details, but their details are important. And in a succession law, we have learned that small differences in timings of death can make big and unexpected differences in the effects of death on an estate. What the bill does is therefore very important. Uh, the point has been made previously uh, by John Scott about the, uh, and today by John Scott about the benefits of consolidating this piece of leg legislation with any future bill in succession and remain open to this possibility and, un uh, and undertake to give this full consideration at the relevant time, if, if I am here or my successors, I should say. Much of what we have done in this, um, this bill amends the fallback position where a will does not make express provision about what will happen in a defined set of circumstances. The one point that struck me, though, uh, through this process and will arise again in the consideration of any further reforms to the law in this area is the importance of making a will and, and Stuart Stevenson made that point uh, very very clearly. I can understand why people shy away, shy away from it or put it off to another day but as Stuart and Stevenson indicated uh, a will itself can be quite a simple document but I'm aware through letters we receive at the Scottish Government the misery and chaos which can follow uh, someone dying without a will. So I hope that the debate around this bill has caused people to stop and think about their own circumstances and take whatever action they need. I'm entirely sympathetic with the view that it was undesirable to have to deal with changes around uh, bondification at stage three, and I wholeheartedly welcome the committee's decision to take evidence earlier this week. And I, I would like to give reassurance to, to members John Scott uh, requested this, that certainly we will use the additional powers we put in the bill, uh, which are quite wide ranging uh, sparingly, and it's not our intention. Uh, I will indeed. If, uh... Stuart Stevenson. I beg your pardon. Um, just noting that in taking evidence, that is what led to the manuscript amendments that uh, the presiding officer accepted, and I think shows the validity of doing the process the committee did. Minister, please note uh, the debate is now eaten into the time of the next debate, so as briefly uh, as possible. Um, I, I certainly agree with that, that sentiment, but I do hope the debate has, has, has prompted people to stop and think. Um, this is not a situation I would envisage occurring even on a regular basis in the context of the Scottish Law Commission Bill procedure. Of course, on this occasion, the situation is not one of our own making, and um, uh, hopefully today's debate has clarified that. But given the concerns about the impact of Zurich's decision, it would have been remiss, I think, of the Scottish Government not to act quickly and to do what it could to try and remedy the position. I hope the committee members take comfort from their own involvement in that. Uh, doing nothing would have placed a new and unwelcome burden on small and contentious estates. It would have left the market further exposed should Royal Sun Alliance also at some point decide to withdraw and would create a position where a legal requirement was incapable of being met, resulting in estates being incapable of being wound up. Um, I would just like briefly in the time I have remaining just to respond to a couple of points that have been made uh, by, by colleagues. I'd like to assure again, Mr Scott, that if issues arise in relation to the change in, in creation, they could be addressed swiftly under the powers in the bill if we need to. Um, there would no, be no need to wait for a second bill to achieve that. So um, while there will be uh, plans to, to have a second bill, we, we don't need to address that particular point through that route. And I'm very grateful to Mr uh, Scott for his kind remarks, not just about myself, but particularly about my bill team who have worked very hard on the bill, and I appreciate that sentiment. Um, to Margaret McDougall, who asked about uh, where direct descendants were, uh, would be affected in terms 
terms of where the inheritance would go, just to say the uh, bequest would fall and go into the residual estate, the estate that's available to either a named residual legatee or legatees, or to be devolved under the laws of intestacy. So I'm happy to put that on the record, and hopefully that will clarify for those individuals who are interested in that point. Uh, presiding officer, uh, in summary, this is a worthy bill which will bring much needed reform, and I would urge you to support the bill, members across the chamber, to support the bill today to ensure that it is passed at stage three. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the Succession Scotland Bill. We next we now turn to the next item of business, which is debate on motion number 15441 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Bill. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, but I must notify the Chamber that this debate is now very tight for time. I call on Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, no more than 10 minutes, please. Uh, Sign officer, I offer my thanks to the Justice Committee, the clerks of the committee and those who gave evidence during stage one scrutiny of the bill. And I welcome the support for the general principles of the bill given in the committee stage one report. Sign officer, abusive behaviour within our communities should not be tolerated. Such behaviour can rob people of their dignity and cause lasting scars on their lives and the lives of their families. Tackling such behaviour requires a bold response. A strong and well-targeted police presence, effective prosecution and a court system equipped to deal with this behaviour is therefore crucial. But our laws too must also recognise aspects of abuse, abusive behaviour can evolve as a technology advances and our understanding of the different elements of abusive behaviour improves. This bill will ensure that many dedicated people who work in our criminal justice agencies are better able to deal with abusive behaviour and sexual harm so as to improve the opportunities for access to justice for victims, enhance a justice system which puts victims at the centre whilst maintaining the appropriate balance for the rights of the accused and increase public confidence in our justice system. Officer, the Justice Committee focused much of their stage one scrutiny on two key aspects of the bill, statutory jury directions and the uh, intimate images offence. We are pleased that the committee, unanimously in relation to the new offence and by majority in relation to the jury directions, supports these two sets of provisions. In respect of jury directions, the Scottish Government included these provisions in the bill to deal with the unfortunate fact that some members of a jury will take with them into the jury room preconceived and ill-founded attitudes as to how sexual offences are likely to be committed and how someone subject to a sexual offence will likely react. It is the case that some members of the public continue to think that someone carrying out a sexual offence will almost always require to use physical force, that the person subject to the sexual offence will almost always offer physical resistance, and that a report to the police by the victim about the sexual offence will almost always be made immediately. Where people hold these views, it is unfortunate that they can allow such unenlightened views to cloud how they assess the evidence in a case. Officer, there is comprehensive research that shows people react in many different ways when a sexual offence is taking place and in the aftermath of an offence taking place. This body of research shows it is perfectly normal, a normal reaction for a person not to offer physical resistance or not to report the offence for a period of time. When jurors are making decisions about guilt of an accused, it is critical that they only consider the evidence they have heard in the case. The intent behind jury directions is simple. We want to help ensure as much as possible that the focus of the jury is only on the evidence laid before them and that any preconceived or ill-founded attitudes do not play a part in the decision of the jury. There is discretion for the judge as to whether a jury direction is of course needed. I will give way to the member. Thank Margaret you for Mitchell. taking the intervention. Could you confirm, that, um, Cabinet Secretary, if the research to which you refer uh, includes uh, actual jurors? Minister, Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, the member may have misheard the point I actually made. It was regarding uh, research relating to how people react after a sexual offence has been committed or during a sexual offence. So it wasn't around the issue which the member has just uh, raised there. Uh, if uh, no issues are, say, raised at the trial relating to a delay in reporting of a sexual offence, the jury direction is not required. Even where an issue relating to delay may have been heard in evidence, the judge does not have to give the direction if they consider no reasonable jury would think the issue of delay was material to whether the offence had been committed. The bill also provides for judicial discretion and flexibility so as to ensure jury directions are only required where it is relevant to the case. Also, the new intimate images offence is designed to respond to concerns that with advances in technology, sharing without consent of private intimate images has become far more widespread in recent years. This behaviour is unacceptable. While we know that a number of existing laws can, in certain circumstances, be used to hold perpetrators to account, we consider reform of the criminal law is needed. A specific offence is justified so that victims and perpetrators alike understand this behaviour is criminal. It is easier for law enforcement, to take, for law enforcement agencies to take action, and it is clearer in the future for people to know that someone who committed such behaviour in the past through a conviction being recorded on their criminal record for the specific intimate images offence rather than a more general offence. We agree with the views expressed, uh, indicating rising awareness and educating about the dangers of inappropriate use of new technologies is important, especially amongst our young people. Sign officer, the introduction of a specific domestic abuse aggravator will ensure courts always give consideration to the fact an offence is associated with domestic abuse when sentencing and improve the recording of such offences. Our changes to allow for Scottish courts to hear certain child sexual offences cases which took place elsewhere in the UK will ensure there is no hiding place for perpetrators. I may note in the stage one report, which indicates that the committee were not convinced of the benefits of the non-harassment order provisions. We consider the small but important change in the bill as to how criminal non-harassment orders operate, uh, operate will improve the ability for protection to be put in place for victims of harassment by allowing for a speedy response from the police to help protect such victims. Mr. Officer, the final area contained in the bill relates to civil orders used to protect communities from sexual harm. The bill introduces sexual harm prevention orders and sexual risk orders. The primary purpose of these orders is the prevention of sexual harm. Our reforms to the existing civil order regime will provide increased protection for adults and children from those who may commit sexual offences. Police Scotland is supportive of these reforms. Their clear view is that they would rather prevent a sexual crime than investigate and convict someone for that crime. And we absolutely agree these reforms will help in that aim. It is, of course, appropriate that, as with the current system, there should be safeguards in place. These safeguards include the independent court has, the, has to be satisfied, these orders are proportionate and that they are necessary. An individual can appeal against the making or the varying of such an order. In addition, the Scottish Government's policy intent is that the individual is able to make oral representation to the court before an order is imposed. And we are considering whether a small change at stage two of the bill is required to put this matter beyond any doubt. Of course, I'll give way.
committee would very much welcome that as one of the recommendations we put into the bill. I think you'd have issues with ECHR and the right to, you know, a, a, pay, a, a representation and to have a, a say in something. So rather than just having the right of appeal to a right to be heard in advance seems to me very significant. Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, officer, the intention was always that they would have the right to make representations, but in order to put that matter beyond any doubt, we are considering whether there is a, uh, and a measure we can take at stage two uh, in order to offer further reassurance and clarification in that particular area. Officer, uh, both males and females can be victims of domestic abuse and sexual violence. However, we know that women and girls are disproportionately victims of these crimes. This bill should therefore be firmly seen within the wider context of an extensive range of Scottish Government activity to address violence against women and girls. This includes new funding of £20 million committed from the Justice Budget over 2015-16 to 2017-18 for measures to tackle violence against women and girls. This funding is already making a real difference with handling of domestic abuse court cases speeding up and the uh, Rape Crisis Scotland, expanding the support that they are able to offer to sexual violence victims. Cabinet Secretary, so officer, could you I, close? I welcome the support in the Stage 1 report for the general principles of the Bill, and I move that the general principles of the Bill are agreed. Many thanks. I just reiterate to the Chamber that there is no time in this debate, and I call on Christine Graham to speak to on to speak on behalf of the Justice Committee, maximum seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding <laughs> Officer. I'm pleased to be speaking on behalf of the Justice Committee, which has scrutinised this bill. I thank the witnesses who replied to the call for evidence. In all, the committee received submissions from 34 different bodies and individuals. It held four meetings and heard from 16 witnesses, from the legal and law enforcement professions, from academics, from groups working with the victims of crime, from the Children's Commission and the Scottish Human Rights Commission. And while I'm at it, I want to thank the committee, the very hard working Justice Committee. We also heard from representatives of the judiciary and in passing I'd like to congratulate Lord Carloway on his recent appointment to Lord President and Lord Justice Clark. This was announced shortly after he gave evidence to the committee so I don't think we sabotaged it but I don't think it ended with his elevation either. This is a bill in six parts and so you can't really talk about it in the round so I'll try to deal with some separate parts and I don't have a lot of time so I'm going to miss quite a few and I hope committee members pick it up. The non the two main parts, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, the non-consensual sharing of images. Sometimes the media calls this revenge porn, and the committee is aware that this is not terminology everyone thinks we should use. With advances in technology and increasing use of social media, it's become all too easy to use the internet to humiliate other people. When it involves sharing intimate photographs or videos of another person, photos that were never meant to be shared with a wider audience, and are perhaps sent out on the internet following acrimonious breakup. This can be particularly poisonous and harmful. In our report, we said we supported the new offence in this area, and this received some coverage in the media. Press reporting was along the lines the committee had given the green light quotes to making quotes revenge porn an offence. On the same day, the Scottish media also carried the story of a young man from Paisley who had been convicted of putting intimate photographs of his next partner online. Under common law, he was sentenced to six months for what the press called a revenge porn conviction. But evidence made it clear that it was not always easy to apply the current criminal law in this area. There are grey areas that may also truly be hurtful behaviour and they escape criminal censure. Even where a conviction is successful, the courts may lack the sentencing options that the crime merits. I believe the current maximum is under the bill. The maximum would be at least five, will be five years. The drafting of a new law provides an opportunity to make clear that sharing intimate age images of another person without their consent and with an intention or recklessness as to whether this causes hurt or humiliation is a crime. The committee believes the bill is on the right track. But we've made some observations on the drafting of the offence we'd like the Scottish Government to reflect on, and I suspect other members will pick up on it. But one of the examples is simply the definition of what is a public place. It's always a difficult area to define. There is also the opportunity in agreeing to this change in the law to make clear that this behaviour is socially unacceptable, so preventative legislation. Most people will know this, but there are some particularly perhaps the young, who may lack the insight or maturity to realise just how much harm it can cause. We did hear concerns that the bill may lead 
to the criminalisation of behaviour that some young people might rightly or wrongly consider OK, normal, every day. But the majority of evidence, including from the Children's Commissioner, was that this was not in itself a good reason to exclude young people from the ambit of the offence, not least because the victims of this behaviour will usually be young people themselves. They also deserve the protection of the law, and of course images on the internet can live forever. The committee agrees with this. We also do this, however, in the expectation that the vast majority of cases involving children and young people would not go before the courts or even before the children's panel, but there will be some discretion as to what happens with young people. Now to the second part, jury directions relating to sexual offences. The bill agreed in its current form, then for the first time, and I emphasise first time, it will set out in statute what directions judges must give to juries in certain cases. To put the matter broadly, if evidence has led us to an apparent delay in reporting or telling anyone about an alleged sexual assault, then the judge must direct the jury that there may be good reasons as to why there was this delay. If evidence has led us to an apparent absence of physical resistance to an alleged sexual assault, the judge must direct the jury that there may be good reasons as to why a person may not have physically resisted such an assault. The government's view we've heard is that this is necessary to make this intervention because misconceptions about how people respond to sexual trauma may lurk in the minds of some juries, jurors. There was some consensus in evidence that the Scottish Government is probably right. Juries are, of, after all, composed of ordinary people, some of whom may well bring their misconceptions into the jury room. Beyond this point of general agreement, this provision very much split our witnesses and split the committee. Evidence from the Law Society, the Faculty of Advocates, from legal academics and from the judiciary itself was to the effect that the proposals would, at best, achieve little and, at most, risk doing actual harm. They said that they would effectively force judges to give guidance as to apparent matters of fact that, in the view of the judge, were not relevant to the trial the jury had just sat through. Evidence from victims' groups, from the police and Crown Office, and from some other legal academics was equally strong in support of the proposals. The directions were seen as uncontroversial statements of fact that could only be of assistance to a jury in coming to a more informed view. It was that view which prevailed in the Justice Committee's report with what the report describes as a clear majority of the committee agreeing that directions may, in relevant cases, help ensure that justice is done. The majority also took the view that setting out the requirement to give the directions in statute will also ensure a more consistent approach in courts. Those of us in the minority would have preferred to wait at least for the conclusion of a forthcoming piece of research on decision-making by juries, which the Scottish Government is sponsoring before any decision is taken in this area. Now, I knew that I wouldn't have time to address non-harassment orders, the domestic abuse aggravator, new civil orders, and sexual acts elsewhere in the UK. Always very, all very, very important and serious parts of this bill. So I do hope members, whilst I've not used up all the information, will take this opportunity to develop those points and say that the committee does support the general principles of the bill, subject to our recommendations, some of which I know the Cabinet Secretary is already chewing over, if that's not too colloquial a phrase. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Now call on Dr Elaine Murray. Up to seven minutes, please, Dr Murray. Uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking the clerks and the witnesses who gave both written and oral evidence at stage one. There are two parts of this bill which were more contentious than the rest, uh, judicial directions and whether the provisions regu regarding the distribution of intimate photographs without consent ought to be extended to other forms of communication. Section 1, which introduces a statutory aggravation where an offence consists of the abuse of a partner or ex-partner, was generally welcomed by witnesses. This aggravation also includes where an offence is committed against a third party with the intent to cause distress to the partner or ex-partner. For example, actions taken or threatened to be taken against a person's child. The aggravation also applies where the offender has been reckless as to whether they cause the, the victim to suffer physical or psychological harm. The intent to cause harm does not to be proved for the aggravation to apply. Some witnesses would have liked a specific offence of domestic abuse to be introduced. This bill doesn't do so, though I understand the government is consulting on this possibility. 
The aggravation in this bill also only applies to partners, ex-partners and people who are or have been in an intimate personal relationship and therefore would not apply to uh, the physical or psychological abuse of children or elderly relatives, for example. And I hope that if a specific offence is introduced in the next Parliament, of co coercive control of a wider range of victims will be included. Section 2 uh, introduces two offences related to so-called revenge porn, though that is an inappropriate term, uh, disclosing or threatening to disclose intimate photographs or films without the person's consent. Again, the, the offence covers the intention to cause fear, alarm or distress and recklessness as to whether fear, alarm or distress is caused. In both the case of the aggravation and the new offences, not meaning to cause harm to the victim will not be able to be used as a defence. <coughs> Witnesses <coughs> excuse me, were strongly supportive of this proposal, believing that it will send out an unequivocal message about the unacceptability of such behaviour, which, as Professors McGlynn and Rackley stated in evidence, contributes to the normalisation of non-consensual sexual activity and to creating a climate in which women's sexual expression is not respected. Some witnesses, such as Scottish Women's Aid and Abused Men in Scotland, argued that the offence is too narrow and should also include sound files or texts concerning an, inti uh, an intimate situation. Some of us on the committee had considerable sympathy for this uh, viewpoint, though a majority agreed with Cabinet Secretary that there could be unintended consequences in drawing the offence too widely. Uh, and I know that my colleague Margaret uh, McDougall, who pursued this in, in committee, will be speaking on this today. Uh, other witnesses argue that the offences drafted was already too broad. Michael Meehan of the Faculty of uh, Advocates cited the example of a person taking a photo of their flatmate asleep in, on the couch in their underwear and sharing it with another person as being within the scope of offence, as the term of intimate images also includes non-sexual images. And I have to say I don't have much sympathy for that situation if the image was shared without the consent of the person involved. Uh, concerns were also expressed about whether the offence would criminalise young people involved in sexting. Uh, the Children's Commissioner argued that the Crown would have discretion and that offences involving children would be referred to the children's hearing rather than the criminal court. He also argued strongly for an education and information programme advising children and young people of the dangers of some of these activities. The bill provides for a defence of sharing an image which was taken in a public place so that images of people taken on a beach, for example, would not be covered. However, other witnesses drew our attention to the disgusting practice, practice of upskirting, where photographs of body parts are taken without a woman's consent and distributed. The activity in itself is illegal, however, the distribution of such uh, photographs is not caught by the bill. Jury directions was the other more content controversial issue in the bill. The bill amends the Crim Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1975, such that when a, a evidence has been led in a sexual offence trial that the victim, or perhaps more accurately the complainer, did not tell or delayed telling anyone, anyone about the offence, or whether they did not report or delayed reporting the offence to the police, the judge must have advised the jury that there may be good reasons why the victims of sexual offences sometimes don't immediately report the offence to another person or to the police. Similarly, if evidence is led regarding a lack of physical resistance by the complainer or if the line of questioning elicits this information, the judge must also advise the jury that there can be good reasons why victims of sexual offences don't necessarily physically resist their attacker. Members of the judiciary, such as Lord Car Carloway and Sheriff Little, were opposed to these directions. They argued that, uh, that making such judicial directions mandatory in cases where evidence of this time has been led or elicited introduced a precedent and that there would be similar pressure for similar treatment of other offences. They also argued that advice on these matters could be included in the jury manual. Uh, the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates were, were also unconvinced, as were some members of the committee. However, Labour members of the committee agree with the Scottish Government on this matter. When the abolition of the requirement for corroboration was introduced in the first draft of the Criminal Justice Bill, we thought long and hard before deciding that we couldn't support it. We felt that more sexual uh, offence and dom domestic abuse cases might come to trial, but that without corroboration the prosecution would be more likely to fail. And we were also concerned about prosecution of other offences on the basis of the evidence of one person. However, this is a very different circumstance. Juries are made up of ordinary people. Now, we do not need to undertake a lot of jury research to know that the general public hold misconceptions about sexual offences. Unfortunately, a lot of people still think that a woman's behaviour can contribute to the offence committed against her. Those perceptions can be compounded if the victim has delayed reporting the offence or has not physically resisted her attacker. If evidence of those matters is part of the trial, the judge should remind the jury that it does not constitute consent. The bill also extends the ability of the courts to award a non-harassment order for domestic abuse offence 
uh, to, in circumstances where the alleged offender has not been fit to stand trial, although the evidence suggested that the person was guilty. The committee didn't oppose this, but we weren't quite clear how useful this would be in practice if the person was not fit to stand trial in the first place. So I think there's some issues. It, we don't oppose it, but I'm not quite sure how useful it is. Uh, the bill also extends the jurisdiction of the Scottish courts to prosecute offences committed against children elsewhere in the UK. I think that needs a slight amendment, but it is welcomed. Uh, and it abolishes sexual uh, offences prevention orders, foreign tra travel orders and risk of sexual harm orders replacing them with sexual harm prevention orders and sexual, sexual risk orders, similar to the rest of the United Kingdom. Obviously, we'll be looking forward to further discussion at stage two, but I'm very happy to support this bill here tonight at stage one. Many thanks. <clears throat> now I call on Margaret Mitchell, up to five minutes, please. Presiding officer, the Abuse of Behaviour and Sexual Harm Bill is an important piece of legislation which seeks to address hugely vexing, emotive and, in some cases, complex issues. I am grateful for the constructive views and evidence on the Bill's key provisions from the many witnesses who appeared before the Committee during the Stage 1 scrutiny process. I would also like to thank the Committee's clerks for compiling such a, a comprehensive Stage 1 report. The Bill covers six distinct provisions, namely a domestic abuse aggravator, the non-consensual sharing of images, jury directions in relation to sexual offences, non-harassment orders, sexual acts elsewhere in the UK and sexual harm prevention orders. The committee agreed the bill's general principles and there was general consensus on the findings on the provision, uh, provisions with the exception of jury directions in relation to sexual offences, which was the most contentious provision. Here both the convener and myself considered that at the very least more research must be carried out before such a dramatic provision is enforced, which I consider could be a dangerous and unwelcome precedent by eroding the judiciary's discretion and the division of powers. The raison d'etre for this provision was to address potential and recognised misconceptions by juries in sexual offences cases relating to an absence of physical resistance, a time delay in reporting by victims. However, these are both issues that can adequately be dealt with by the use of expert witnesses. The only barrier to this is the cost implications acknowledged by both Catherine Dyer, Chief Executive of the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service, and Lord Car Carloway, the then J Lord Justice Clark. But, presiding officer, cost should not be an issue here. However, it is worth stressing that if the aim of this provision is to address issues known to make a successful conviction more difficult in sexual offence cases, then there is an opportunity here at Stage 2 to look again at legal aid for opposing the inappropriate requisitioning of medical records, which are then frequently used to discredit complainers. Whilst a complainer or a third party has the locus to object to the release of their medical records at the hearing to determine application for the recovery, in most cases, they can't afford legal representation to object, as currently they are not granted legal aid. This is a situation which could be easily rectified. All that is required is the political will. Turning now to the domestic abuse aggravator provision, which would see tougher sentences for perpetrators of domestic abuse committed against a partner or ex-partner and extended now also to a third party, such as a child or close friend. The Cabinet Secretary has confirmed this will apply to a first offence. In such circumstances, clearly the aggravation needs to be applied proportionately and with common sense. And here, Sheriff Derek Pyle has urged caution when he commented that the judiciary has to identify the cases which, uh, where there is a concerted and serious abuse, as opposed to what he terms little more than domestic arguments expected of any couple. Meanwhile, the Law Society has expressed concern that the inclusion of third parties would make the aggravation difficult to prove due to the requirement to, estab to establish intention and recklessness. The introduction of the new statutory non-consensual sharing of intimate images provision was widely supported to create greater clarity in relation to this distressing and humiliating practice for victims who are often vulnerable adolescents and young adults. However, there were differing, view, differing views from witnesses as to whether this had been achieved and also concern about the practical implications of the consent defence. 
The provision to allow the Scottish courts to cover sexual offences against children within the UK were intended to be practical provisions, but again raised concerns about jurisdiction implications and the definition of Scottish residency. Whilst the committee was sympathetic to the intent behind the introduction of non-harassment orders, it questioned the practical implications. Similarly, whilst the reforms to the system of civil orders are well-intentioned, they were introduced without full consultation, and serious issues and concerns raised in evidence will have to be addressed. And I welcome the Government's commitment to do this at Stage 2. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, whilst the Scottish Conservatives support the general principles of the Bill, there is clearly a lot of work to be done at Stage 2 to ensure that it is fit for purpose. Many thanks. And we now move to the open debate. Four minute speeches, type for time. Colin Gill Patterson to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Presiding Officer, I rise to speak uh, to one of the most significant sections uh, of the Bill, and that is statutory jury directions rel relating to sexual offences. And at this point, can I declare an interest as a former member of Rape Crisis? I, and uh, I would not be speaking uh, on behalf of any organisation, Rape Crisis or otherwise, but I am fairly certain that most of what I have got to say, that women's uh, organisations in general it will, will agree uh, with me, because it is common currency within the organisations that take care of women and children in these circumstances where rape takes place, that they believe, and it's, that this belief has been here for decades, that the, that the deck is stacked against someone who complains uh, about uh, rape. They, they, know, they know that juries have preconceived ideas before they enter into the court. And these, these are quite common uh, 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 currency uh, within all the different groups. And I, what, what juries expect to happen uh, in a trial when it comes to rape, uh, they expect that the demeanour uh, of an individual to be in, in a particular fashion. They certainly expect them to be somewhat uh, excited. Uh, they expect them to uh, be traumatised uh, uh, in some regards. They, they expect them to show stress, mm -hmm. and they certainly expect uh, emotion, including a uh, loss of control. Um, when it comes to a, a physical a, a force, mm -hmm. they expect that a clinician should be able to produce evidence that a force was there and evident. Of course, there are many, many reasons that a uh, delay in reporting uh, takes place. It, it's fairly uh, simple. That again, in, in, in rape ca cases, you know, it, it's common knowledge that people feel that they won't be, be, be believed, and then common trauma in itself. People, uh, you know, not uh, understanding themselves what has taken place, and many rapes take place by those that are known to the person, the victim that has been raped, and they fear the consequences, not just for themselves, but they fear the consequences for their extended family, perhaps children that may be in the same room. Uh, so the other expectation is uh, to, that, that uh, juries expect. They do expect to see stress and emotion. Now, in 40 years' experience in the motor industry, and what my business is about that my son now runs, is when somebody has an accident with a car. And let me tell you that people get very, very emotional, or some people get very emotional. Even for a tiny scratch, people have been known, to, including men, to cry when the car gets, gets damaged. And, you know, the present, uh, all, it will be happening today, no doubt, that people were very, very stressed for something that is very, very small. And they also say something very often, don't tell my husband, don't tell my wife, don't tell my boss, can I pay it myself? And they do it for a whole range of reasons. And of course, that's the same when it comes to rape trials. People act in a different manner. Uh, some people can be very, very concise in what they do, and the reason they do that they, they want to be concise to get their Joshua, story. Close, I can please. see I've been asked to, to, to wind up already, but can I just say uh, that, presiding officer, that, that we need uh, to educate jurors and jurors 
juries must have an open mind and judges giving jury directions will help to educate and be, uh, be good for justice in general. Thank you. Many thanks. Now, call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Sir, I welcome this bill and taking each of its main six, six main proposals in turn. I support the introduction of a domestic uh, abuse uh, aggravator, which will allow um, um, the relevant of offence to be placed within the context of domestic abuse and ensure that the domestic abuse is taken into account in sentences. This, of course, should not be a substitute for a new specific offence uh, of domestic abuse, and I don't think either should be broadened out uh, to uh, include uh, wider family members, since this, the whole of this bill really must be seen within the wider context of the government's work on violence against women, as the Cabinet Secretary reminded us. Now, of course, we were expecting a specific offence of domestic abuse to capture coercive and controlling behaviour in this legislation, but I accept the reasons that have been given for a further consultation on that, so we look forward to that legislation uh, in the next uh, Parliament. Um, I think um, there could be perhaps an addition uh, at uh, Clause 2A to make clear that um, the offence uh, occurs regardless as to whether it is committed directly against the partner or ex-partner. It's, it, it's the physical or psychological harm that matters, and perhaps that uh, aspect needs to be made absolutely explicit through amendment at Stage 2. Now, I'll, moving on to the second um, a new uh, uh, element. I support the new offence of non-consensual sharing of uh, Im uh, intimate images. Um, perhaps, as various witnesses have pointed out, there needs to be a clear definition of consent, perhaps around free agreement. As suggested in the, uh, as outlined in the 2009 Sexual Offences Act, and also I, I believe this offence should be extended because, as Police Scotland remind us, and I'm quoting from Police Scotland now, the impact of the written word and sound files of an intimate nature cannot be understated. So I think that uh, extension should certainly be seriously considered, and it's right that it should include children and young people. Uh, and I also support the proposal from Scottish Women's Aid that the government should take forward a campaign of education and information for children and young people around the criminal legal effect of the new offence uh, and its impact on victims. Moving on to non-harassment orders, I disagree with the committee on this. There was a loophole in the law which was highlighted by a prominent figure a year ago, and I, I myself picked that up in questions and debate last year. So I think it is not reasonable to expect a victim to instigate a civil non-harassment order uh, in the circumstances that are dealt with uh, by the legislation. And those who are saying it wouldn't have a practical effect should consider the very real practical effect it will have on making it easier for the police to intervene quickly to protect a victim of harassment. And that was, of course, precisely the issue highlighted uh, last year uh, in the um, well-publicised uh, situation, I think, in the Herald newspaper. Moving on to jury directions, I believe this will make sure that uh, jurors' decision making is not marred by erroneous preconception. Clearly, there are problems in terms of people's jurors' views about delays in reporting uh, and, the, and the lack of a physical uh, resistance uh, in cases of sexual violence. And those two are explicitly dealt with in sections of the bill. It may be, in fact, that there are other issues that may be dealt with, but it's good that those are spelled out in the bill. And research by Professor Louise Ellison of Leeds University and Professor Vanessa Munro of Leicester University found that the introduction of judicial directions of the nature outlined in the bill were likely to increase the prospects for justice. And given how difficult it has proved to uh, uh, secure convictions, particularly for rape, but also other sexual crimes, we must do everything we can Master to make that more possible. Time is uh, running out. I think uh, the last, uh, there is, in fact, a great deal in the bill about the civil orders and, indeed, a bit less about sexual offences committed elsewhere in the UK. But I don't think either of those sections will prove controversial. Many thanks. Now I call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, you know what sexual and domestic abuse is if you've been a victim of either, but refining a specific set of criminal offences that can bring about successful convictions needs hard work, dedication and a comprehension of the Scottish legal system. And I have to say I do welcome the consultation ongoing right now on a definition, um, and I look forward to that coming forward. Presiding officer, the nature of legislating this is convoluted, we know that, and it has to be pre precision-led. Um, it needs to be discussed and debated, like we're doing, so that all the potential loopholes are tightened up, and while at the same time ensuring there's sufficient flexibility to address all different kinds of situations. We've heard many of them this afternoon 
already. The Scottish Government, and I believe specifically the Justice Committee, must be commended for an approach that is both thoughtful, caring and also compassionate when taking their evidence um, and when the evidence was brought about at the committee. They took time to listen and they um, raised a range of themes um, that, that we can continue on into stage two. Um, under the law as it stands in Scotland, there is a crossover between terms like grievous bodily harm and domestic abuse, uh, and that is central to the need to produce an effective legislation that meets the specific needs of the victims. As the Scottish Women's Aid Convention pointed out in its submission, the overarching objective of the bill is to improve how the justice system responds to abusive behaviour, including domestic abuse and sexual harm. It also aims to help improve public safety by ensuring that perpetrators are appropriately held to account for their conduct. But let me take a moment to remind you of some of the statistics around the kind of abuse in Scotland. In 2014-15, there were 59,882 incidents of domestic abuse recorded by the police, an increase of 2.5%. And I hope that increase is more about women feeling more confident to report, but we shouldn't just take it in that context. Of the incidents recorded last year, 54% resulted in at least one crime or offence being committed. And the victims, who are mainly women, 79% of them, um, are most likely to take place at the weekends and in the age group of 26 to 30. The big problem remains low, though women aren't getting justice in the current system, and this bill needs to seek to redress that very issue. Many of you will already be aware of the successful drive to have Clare's Law rolled out in Scotland, something I supported greatly, and also the work that I've done myself in bringing forward just even awareness of the issue of revenge porn, and I am looking forward to that becoming a specific uh, criminal offence. And can I pay tribute at this point to all the organisations who have informed me and helped me, and I look very, very much to uh, seeing their success being wrung out into uh, decent legislation. Presiding officers, these are, these are good improvements, and they're improving access. But the civil protections they offer are, however, still not incentive enough for more women to seek the assistance of the law. There are too many aspects that discourage women from reporting incidents to the police. We need to change that. And that's why this bill will include the introduction of a statutory aggravator. As the Scottish Women's Convention again says, such a measure in relation to domestic abuse sends a message that those who perpetrate such crimes will be adequately punished. Marking out revenge porn is vital for victims for the right due process and to get the right convictions that will send out a clear message. This is unacceptable and there will be a zero tolerance approach if you do this. Social media gives us so many ways to express ourselves and opinions, however in some cases bizarre or unpopular our opinions may be, but it gives no one the right to post pictures of ex-partners without either their knowledge or consent. It is not a licence to abuse. Personal use of technology in its many forms is very difficult uh, for police. It's easy to press the button, post the picture up, and yet the sad and tragic tales of those who have been exposed to revenge porn Georgia, tell us close, how utterly devastating the effect can be. Presiding officer, I support this legislation in its entirety. I look forward to stage two, and as the bill moves forward, um, I hope that we create a piece of legislation that means a hefty price will be paid to the per perpetrators. Many thanks. Now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Christian Allard. I, thank you, and I'm pleased to speak after Christina McKelvey. I know this is something that she has campaigned long and hard on as well as myself. I, I thank the government for bringing forward the bill, and in doing so, it has recognised the need to keep battling the damage done by abusive behaviour and sexual harm. It falls short of providing for a new criminal offence of domestic abuse, and I know that campaigners have been concerned by that. But I consider that the government is right to have chosen to consult separately on that. I think in order principally to get the definition right, and it's worth taking time to do that. But I do look forward to a commitment from all parties in this chamber, whatever the outcome of the election, that a bill will be brought forward early in a new session. The bill does introduce a domestic abuse aggravator, which is to be welcomed. And in the little time I have, I wanted to focus on two of the provisions within the bill. The first is the non-consensual sharing of images offence. This addresses a gap in legislation that has allowed what is known as revenge porn to gain a foothold in Scotland, just as it has elsewhere. The insidious and malicious sharing of intimate images can destroy lives. It can cause victims huge harm. So we need to ensure that perpetrators can be held to account for their actions and the creation of a new criminal offence will be an important step in the right direction. I believe there's a significant under-reporting of this issue, and it's important that victims don't suffer in silence and know that they've done nothing wrong. 
introducing specific le legislation to tackle these despicable and cowardly acts will give victims the confidence that such violations of their privacy are unacceptable and illegal. In addition to empowering more people to seek justice, creating this specific criminal offence will help overcome any archaic attitudes towards this cruel weapon that is used to cause distress, embarrass, manipulate or humiliate someone. Now, some witnesses urged us to go further and protect written text and voice recordings as well, but I agree with the government's response in that they would not wish to dilute this offence or cause confusion, and I think we should, we should keep it very focused. Alongside the legislation, though, I think there's a need to have a national strategy, as recommended by HMICS in November last year, to ensure that young people in particular understand the risks of what's known as sexting. The HMICS report warned that sexting, defined as the posting of self-generated intimate images on social media networks, is now considered a way of life by some young people and could increase the vulnerability of young people at the risk of exploitation. So I would welcome an assurance from the Cabinet Secretary that the Scottish Government intend to take forward the report's recommendations to develop a strategy addressing these risks. The second provision I want to mention is jury directions. I acknowledge that this particular provision has proven controversial. And truth be told, at the beginning of this process, I was not entirely convinced that it was necessary. Having considered the evidence at stage one, I am persuaded, not only by the well-articulated case made by organisations such as Rape Crisis Scotland and Scottish Women's Aid, and the research carried out with mock juries, but also by some of the outdated and frankly astonishing comments of some judges over the years. Members might be aware of a recent appeal court ruling overturning a lenient sentence that described the sentencing judge's comments as controversial. Comments such as essentially non-violent relationship rapes and condoning or acquiescing in rapes certainly are controversial. Responding to questioning committee, Lord Carloway told us that in relation to sexual offences, the law is progressing. It is moving from a certain position where it was 20, 30 or 40 years ago into the modern era. I have to say that the movement's glacial and it's time for change. There are um, worryingly close, prevalent views, and if the picture across Scotland is that in jurors' minds, it will go into the courtroom with them as they hear evidence, will go into the jury room as they deliberate. Jury directions are a sensible safeguard to introduce, and the Liberal Democrats will support the bill this evening. Many thanks. Now I call on Christian Allard to be followed by Margaret MacDougall. Thank you very much, President Officer. Let me add my thanks to the Justice Committee team as well, the clerks and members uh, of, of the committee. Uh, who put together this report at stage one. I will also uh, thank the Scottish Government for its response. We are all going in the same direction when it comes to uh, tackling revenge porn. I say revenge porn, presenting officer, because abusive behaviour and sexual harm won't do. Revenge porn is what it's all about, really. And we heard a lot of evidence, uh, some we took in private, and which was very heart and very, very difficult to take. Evidence in case of revenge porn that we are calling today abusive behaviour and sexual harm. Uh, I'm just going to really use uh, some of the words in his opening remarks. Uh, let me read from the policy memorandum of the bill. Concern has been expressed by certain ill-funded preconceptions held by members of the public who make up juries about the nature of sexual violence, make understanding victims' response to such crime more difficult. But it's what it's all about. To me and many of us, this is where the problem is. Members of the public us have ill-founded preconceptions about the nature of sexual violence. We need to admit this. We don't understand how a victim can feel safer, uh, can feel after such an attack. Uh, we don't get it, President Officer, unless you've been a victim, like Christina McKelvey said before me. This is why uh, I agree uh, uh, with the committee, with the majority of the committee, uh, to support jury direction. Uh, we receive plenty of evidence on it, and. Uh, 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 is a way the bill should be set out. It should be regarded as being part of judicial uh, knowledge. Uh, Eleanor Deming, the legal officer for the Scottish, Scottish Human Rights Commission, said on the 24th of uh, November last year, Article 6 of the ES ECHR protects the right to a fair trial. Article 6.1 sets out a number of general aspects for a fair trial. And Article 6.2 and 6.3 set out the minimum rights to be afforded to a person accused of a criminal offence. 
The Commission understands that the proposal is being introduced to address a particular issue. And this is what, what it's all about, uh, President Officer. We know that perception is that people hold misconception about the conduct of victims of sexual offences. Uh, and I agree with the Scottish Human Rights Commission jury direction as per the bill proposes will not prejudice an accused personal article six right as long as the directions are essential, factual, and controversial statements. And this is very important that they need to be exactly that. Uh, President Officer, I was very much concerned about the impact of the bill could have on young people. I need it not to be uh, as the governor stated, Tam Bell is a children and young people's commissioner for Scotland, put my mind to rest when he gave evidence uh, to us. He said uh, he agreed uh, uh, that uh, uh, we don't have to have any concern about judicial uh, direction being given on the matter. Uh, and he agreed as well that calling the expert witnesses uh, to give context was not the most efficient way to proceed. One particular point that I would like to emphasize is that, as young, uh, the Young People's Commissioner for Scotland put it, in the fullness of time, as a result of public education and greater awareness, judicial direction may not be needed. So it's, it's a very important point to, to repeat. And because I'm short of time, I, I won't be able to develop uh, another part of the bill. Uh, what I would like in conclusion, President Officer, is to state one in four women with experienced domestic abuse in a lifetime. One in 10 women in Scotland have been raped. 21% of girls and 11% of boys in the UK have experienced child sexual abuse. This is why this parliament needs to back this stage one report. And to agree with the majority of the committee that jury direction is an important part of the bill. Attitudes need to change before we can consider to do that. In conclusion, President Mark, Officer, let me remind please. all members today that organisations at Zero Tolerance, Rape Crisis Scotland, Women's Support Project, Scottish, uh, Scottish Women's Head, White Women's Scotland, and Gender, and many more organisations uh, I want this Parliament to reconsider removing the absolute right for corroboration in Scots law. Very Presenting good. Officer. Many thanks. Now call on Margaret MacDougall to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Abuse of Behaviour and Sexual Harm Bill is a vital piece of legislation introduced to improve how the justice system responds to abusive behaviour, including domestic abuse and sexual harm, following the publication of the Equally Safe report. The bill is in six parts, and in the very short time I have been allocated in this debate, I will concentrate on the non-consensual sharing of private, intimate images, often referred to as revenge porn. As it currently stands, the sharing of intimate images aspect of the bill only includes disclosing or threatening to disclose a photograph or film showing or appearing to show another person in an intimate situation without prior consent. I am supportive of the creation of the new offence, as the law desperately needs to be updated to provide for the new digital age. However, I believe it is too narrow. Everyone these days knows or owns a smartphone, tablet or even a computer, knows that you can screenshot, and this presents a glaring loophole in the legislation, which is the sharing of text. In evidence, Louise Johnson of Scottish Women's Aid stated that by specifying photographs and films, this excludes the sharing of private and intimate written and audio communications. The exposure of the threat of sharing these has the same outcome. It is designed to humiliate and control the victim. Sometimes text and images can be sent at the same time. Would we criminalise the image but not the abusive and threatening text? This was supported by many others, including Police Scotland, who stated that the offence, and I quote, should take cognizance of all forms of communication and distribution. I acknowledge that it was pointed out during the evidence sessions that the sending of abusive or threatening messages is already against the law. The sharing of intimate text or messages isn't. For example, the sharing of an intimate image on Facebook without consent would under this bill be a prosecutable offence. However, if someone was to share an intimate conversation or a screenshot of an intimate conversation, this wouldn't be covered. I would argue that sharing of this type of communication could have the same effect as sharing intimate images without consent. This could cause just as much fear, alarm or distress to the victim and arguably would be designed to do so. 
Just to be clear here, I'm not advocating that we make the process of sexting illegal between consenting adults, nor am I suggesting we criminalise those who are 16 or under who have engaged in the process consensually. In fact, in evidence, the Children's Commissioner, Tam Bailey, stated he was not looking for any exemption for children or young people, but he emphasised the importance of education and that doing so would be more effective in changing behaviours than criminalisation in non-malicious cases. He also mentioned that the financial memorandum makes no provision for what could be a substantial education programme. Presiding officer, what I am proposing is that the sharing of sex or any intimate communications non-consensually should be included as an offence within the bill, extending it from its narrow definition at present. I believe that the bill doesn't go far enough in its terms of tackling this issue, and I have raised these concerns during the committee stages. I am considering submitting amendments at stage two, so I would appreciate if, when closing, the Cabinet Secretary could indicate his views on the points I have raised today. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks. Now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Hans Alan Malik. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I refer briefly to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? The bill contains six elements, all distinct, but turning uh, firstly to what is commonly described as revenge porn, it's worth stressing, as others have mentioned, it's possible to bring criminal proceedings for offences broadly of this nature at the current time, as recent newspaper reports have indicated. But I share the Government's view that for the purposes of clarity and to discourage this offence generally, creating a new offence has clear merit. I was interested by the legal debate on the nature of the offence, in particular Section 21B. And while I believe the concerns of Mr Meehan of the Faculty of Advocates on what might be described as the boxer shorts flatmate situation are overstated, I am certainly sympathetic to the view of Catherine Dyer of the Crown Office when she talks about the focus of this offence really ought to be on the impact on the victim. And I'm heartened by the comments of Professor Chalmers as to the, the fact that this offence has gone somewhat further than the equivalent offence in England and Wales by incorporating the situation where B is reckless, uh, sorry, where A is reckless as to whether B would be caused fear, alarm or distress. He thinks the government's extension is a reasonable one and he's changed his opinion on that. And I certainly agree with those, however, who have concerns about any extension beyond photographs to text, for example. That, to me, would simply open up the matter too far and be particularly difficult, I believe, for children and young people to understand and accept. I believe if we are to have a campaign of education, which the committee recommended and which is referred to briefly in the government's response, I think that campaign needs to have clear and simple messages. And I cannot but think that the inclusion of references to text messages would make that more problematic. On the public place defence, I share the caution of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, however, that it is not the place the photograph is taken that is determinative, rather it is whether the photograph infringes on a person's private sphere. On the issue of incorporating the 2009 definition of consent in the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009, which some submissions referred to, I note the government's comments, but I think we need to be as clear as we can about what constitutes consent. On jury directions, there is clearly a divergence of opinion on this issue. I recognise this is breaking new ground and that the proposal does not have the full-hearted support of the legal establishment. But I take comfort from the comment of Lord Carloway that such directions have been introduced in other Commonwealth jurisdictions and that it could be done here. Although, to be fair, his view was that it was not the best way. But let's remember, such directions have been discussed for some while. They're in the SNP's manifesto for the 2011 election and were the subject of consultation in the government's equally safe consultation. I agree they set a precedent, but a precedent to the context, in the context of widespread agreement that many juries have preconceptions about what a delay in reporting an offence of rape and sexual assault means or what the absence of physical resistance implies. While it is true that there has been no jury research to date in Scotland, it is for the very obvious reason that such research would require an amendment to the Content of Court Act if based on actual juries. I think we are entitled to draw comfort from the researches of Professors Ellison and Munro. And let's remember that, as Catherine Dyer of the Crown Office said in evidence, that directions would be given only if questioning from the Crown or the Defence elicited information that there had been a delay, for example, or that there was an issue about the absence of physical resistance. It's only if these matters are an issue in a particular case that these directions will need to be given. On sexual acts elsewhere in the UK, I think some of the comments of Professor Jarmus might be described as academic, but I'm glad the government has noted them. Turning to the issue of statutory aggregation, there was a consensus, Briefly. with the notable exception of the Law Society, that this was a good idea. 
The Law Society evidence seemed to highlight the acknowledged prominence given to domestic abuse by courts at the current time, with the suggestion that the aggravation was not necessary. I would agree with them as to the current position in the courts, but I'm not persuaded that somehow or other this means that a statutory aggravation is not necessary. As a society, we're becoming well used to the concept, and I have no doubt it will be used effectively. Finally, I am glad that the Government will seek to put the question of oral representation beyond doubt in relation to sexual harm prevention orders and sexual risk orders. I commend the Bill. Excellent. Many thanks. Now, Colin Azala Malik to be followed by John Finney. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. I speak on the abusive behaviour and sexual harm bill with interest. This bill aids, aims to bring Scottish law up to date with many changes, changes in how society views domestic abuse, changes in technology, and to reflect the improved understanding of the issue. My colleagues have covered the issue of non-consultant sharing of images. I would like to add my voice to those that say that legislation should include the sharing of intimate images that are not necessarily sexual. As images can now be shared in an instant, a great deal of damage can be caused by the reckless sharing of images, and therefore that should also in be include included in the legislation too. I also feel that young people should not be excluded from being charged under these new laws, but should be dealt with. This would give some level of support for the victims of any offence who are often young people themselves, because I am sure the courts would take their age into consideration. What I would like to add to the debate is to urge that it is important to consider the um, various aspects of domestic abuse and not only focus on partner abuse or abuse of a phys physical nature. I feel in order to get general equality, the bill should look into the uh, particulars of use of a broader definition of domestic abuse, which includes emotional abuse, uh, control of money, and control of movement in adding some minor in addition some minority communities live in extended families therefore the abuse could be carried out by some by someone other than a partner i also suddenly observed some cases where several mem several family members were involved in extending levels of control over another member of a family Additional development in our understanding is that domestic abuse is not only uh, is not always men abusing women. We can have abuse same-sex partners or a story that I heard of is a mother-in-law beating her new bride, um, daughter-in-law, uh, for burning a roti, which is a chapati in English. We also have violence and control of men family member male family members to give an example of victims of coercion around 20 percent of people asked for help from the uh, forced marriage unit were male not female so in conclusion providing officer i believe that uh, we need to uh, extend the the range of the abuse a little more wider i would like to support uh, the bill in principle um, however, I would like to see uh, the domestic abuse in particular uh, widened up to ensure that we are not only talking about partners, we are not only talking about photography, but we are actually talking about families and how families can be affected by one another, uh, and that needs to be assisted in the bill. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Now, call on John Finney, after which move to closing speeches. Mr. Yeah. Finney. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I, I too would like to thank the witnesses both for those who provided written evidence and oral evidence for their very thought-provoking um, contributions. I hope they are reassured by what they read in the, report that, uh, the Stage 1 report that their, their uh, commentary was taken on board. I would also like to thank uh, the officials for the compilation of the report and the Scottish Government for responding. Like many others, I would like to, to talk about jury directions uh, and say that um, this is something where I have 
simply changed my mind on. Initially, I was very uh, persuaded that the availability of expert evidence, which could be um, put forward either by the prosecution or the defence, was an even-handed way of addressing the issues, particularly of delay in reporting and resistance. Um, I've changed my position on that, and I'll come to explaining why. So what the committee have agreed is that, uh, that uh, this uh, directions would provide relevant factual information for juries, and I don't think that's in dispute, and directions would be delivered more consistently than is presently the case. And part of the reason I, I've been persuaded is because of headlines like Campaigner's Fury as Appeal Judge's Clear Bottom Groper of Sex Attack in Nightclub. This was an incident that went to appeal where a gentleman was initially found guilty of sexual assault placed in the offender register, uh, uh, properly in my opinion, uh, appealed the sentence, and then if I read and in judgment what was said was, it seems to us, however, that um, he, this is the sheriff who makes the original uh, sentence, has not given sufficient attention to the fact that the appellant had consumed a considerable amount of drink beforehand, with the result that the assault can be regarded as drink fueled rather than overtly sexual. That's deeply damaging to a lot of work that's gone on. Now, my colleague Alison McInnes alluded to another case, and that was a case that prompted me to, to put a, a parliamentary motion down, and that was a case of repeated rapes of an adult and sexual abuse of a children. The trial judge referred to the matter as minor. There was a, criticised the adult victim for delay in reporting, claimed the victim was condoning and acquiescing in being raped, pointed out that the accused continued to live, uh, uh, they continued to live with the accused, and used the phrase um, that there was a benefit-grubbing existence. So that motion also talked about the appeal court's comments that the, the judge had no basis for his theories. They welcomed the fact that they increased the sentence, but uh, in my motion I talked about the damage that had done to the good work that's been done by the police, the prosecuting authorities, the statutory and third sector agencies, excuse me, to build victims' confidence in coming forward to report sexual crime, and in that motion, I call on the judicial authorities to examine selection procedures and training, including offering remedial training, if required, as I felt that case very graphically illustrated. Now, I have to say, Lord Carloway addressed this head on when he came to the committee, and, and he did say it's important that the judge should feel free to state exactly what he has selected a particular sentence and must be given free reign to explain his reasoning. Um, if in the course of that reasoning he says something that the appeal court determines is wrong, we will say that, and we will, as we did in that particular case, and we will expect the judge to take into account the appeal court's view and act accordingly. So that's one of the reasons. The other reasons is, and one of my colleagues touched on this earlier, Christian Allard, and that is the very compelling evidence we've received from the Scottish Human Rights Commission about that. And this is all about a balance of rights. And I have to say, in relation to uh, jury direction, I think we have got that right. But beyond that, I think there are issues that we have to deal with. We clearly have to deal with judicial training. Yes, the Cabinet Secretary talked about unenlightened views. It's quite apparent they don't just exist with the public. So the, if someone who, whose views I admire says, the judiciary have had their chance, it's time to legislate. This is appropriate legislation. It's balanced legislation, and the Green Independent Group will support it. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, we now move to closing speeches. Call on Annabelle Goldie up to four minutes, please, Ms Goldie. Uh, <coughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome <coughs> today's Stage 1 debate on the Abuse of Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Bill, and I echo the thanks already expressed to the Justice Committee for a substantial and thorough report, as well as to the witnesses and stakeholders who assiduously helped to inform its findings. From the tenor of the contributions during the debate, it seems there is a consensus that this bill will have a positive impact, not least because it adjusts the criminal justice system to the challenges created by modern communications technology. During the debate, I think there's also emerged a need for some reflection and some refinement of the bill at stage two. Members have already covered many areas of the bill, but in the time available, I would like to focus my remarks on the new statutory aggravator and the controversial introduction of jury directions in sexual offences cases, which I know exercise both the judiciary and legal practitioners alike. The new domestic abuse aggravation, I think, is a welcome acknowledgement that the justice system should treat cases of partner abuse with the seriousness <coughs> such cases demand. Now, I have little doubt that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and the courts are already robust in their current handling of such cases and that special measures are already in place to prosecute them expeditiously 
and with sensitivity. But the tougher sentencing intended to result from the aggravation will provide reassurance to victims that the disposal fully reflects the reality of repeated psychological and physical abuse perpetrated by someone in a position of trust. I do, however, note concerns that the flexibility for the aggravation to be used in relation to first-time offences may have unintended consequences, including the possibility that it could be applied in isolated domestic dispute cases. As such, I would urge the Scottish Government to look again at this at stage two to ensure that the provision does not inadvertently dilute the seriousness of sustained partner abuse and that it is applied proportionately. And turning next to the introduction by Section 6 of two jury directions in sexual offence cases in the context of, firstly, a delay in telling someone about or reporting of the offence to an investigating agency, and secondly, evidence suggesting that sexual activity took place without physical resistance by the complainer. I am sympathetic to the intent behind Section 6, which does seek to dispel the public's preconceptions surrounding some key aspects of sexual violence. However, I do strongly believe that statutory jury directions are not the way to achieve this desired outcome, and I urge caution. Stakeholders were clear that such measures would erode the judiciary's discretion and that there is no empirical evidence that they are required. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, worse than that, they could have the unintended consequence of the defence leading expert evidence that it might not otherwise have proposed simply to mitigate a possible anticipated forensic disadvantage. Now, Lord Carloway, for example, suggested that, and I quote, a better way to do this would be to declare that these uh, measures are within judicial knowledge. I'm slightly paraphrasing his quote. And Sheriff Little argued that, and I quote, the place for such suggestions would be the jury manual. Can I say to the Cabinet Secretary, you know, these are authoritative views. To me, they are persuasive. And the last thing we want to do is in any way um, as Christina McKelvey was observing, um, make more difficult the possibility of convic conviction simply because there might be confusion in the judge's charge to the jury. Having said all that, close, please. subject to these comments, this is a welcome and positive piece of legislation. I do look forward to the government's response at stage two, but my party will support the bill at decision time. Many thanks. Now call on Mr Pearson. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I stand on behalf of uh, Scottish Labour and support the general principles of the Bill. And I have to say that I found the debates throughout this afternoon uh, most edifying and educational. Uh, much has been said about what the Bill seeks to achieve. And I think it's fair to say that uh, in many minds there is a confusion of exactly what it is we are trying to deal with. The prejudices that are brought to this environment often confuse the notion of love and sexual intent, when in actual fact what this legislation seeks to deal with are human beings who seek to control others, who exhibit anger in the way they demonstrate that control, and are happy to use violence and or threats, either actual or inferred, to obtain their own outcomes. And in that context, I welcome the Bill's aim to prevent abuse, harassment or sexual harm, whether using criminal or civil law. The provision that introduces the domestic abuse aggravator, eh, I think, is to be welcomed and is well worthy, eh, worthy of further development as we go forward. I would ask the Minister to, or the Cabinet Secretary to bear in mind an issue that was raised with me only this week at the conclusion of a trial which resulted in a conviction where the victim in that case is now left with the duty on her own behalf of returning to the civil courts to seat an interdict eh, in connection with harassment in the future. And there may well be a gap there in how to deal with long-term domestic abuse and the impacts for eh, victims. The provision of uh, the specific offence for non-consensual sharing of private and intimate images, I think, is one that demands uh, a response in terms of legislation. And I do believe that uh, further analysis of the impacts of text and sound uh, 
files is important and that one should consider the foreseeable impact on an individual of the sharing of such files in the general public it, because sound files and texts can probably do as much damage to a vulnerable individual when shared in the public domain as some of these images that we already know about. The aspect of allowing courts to directly protect victims where the court is satisfied a person did harass another person but a conviction does not take place, I think as was alluded to earlier, is an important aspect too. That we have victims who feel abandoned by the system when the full process of law is unable uh, or unwilling to deliver. And the requirement for uh, specific directions from a court, I've got to say, I'm persuaded that is necessary. Uh, there was comment earlier, and I think it came from, from Christine Graham, about the prejudices that ordinary members of the public bring to the process. I think John Finney has given uh, a great deal of evidence that that prejudice extends beyond the ordinary members of the public. And as a result, uh, we should be able to rely on a judge in placing the right context for a comment to a jury about how evidence might be weighed in their decisions. Uh, I think, too, that uh, the ability for sexual offences, uh, if there is time... Chris uh, at the comments uh, that the judge should tell the jury how they weigh the evidence. That's the matter for the jury and the jury alone. Graham uh, Pearson. Uh, I either misspoke or uh, Christine Graham has misheard. Uh, I don't uh, imagine that a, a judge would tell them how to, but at least explain a context in order that they can make that appraisal for themselves. Uh, the ability for sexual offences committed in England to be prosecuted here in Scotland, again, is to be welcomed and removes the barriers in relation to that aspect of, of legislation. Uh, and the reform the system of civil orders available to protect communities from those who may commit uh, sexual offences, again, I welcome and I look forward to the committee examining the implications that arise from that. Much was said in the Scottish Government consultation equally safe about the levels of support for each of these elements uh, as recommended in, in the bill. Although I'm not a great one for supporting an X-factor approach to if we've got per percentage supports for various elements, there is no doubt there's a general acceptance amongst the public that legislation is necessary and that that legislation should have impact. Uh, in concluding, I have to say that over the years that I, I was involved as a police officer, none was more soul-destroying than seeing families suffering from domestic abuse and the impacts of sexual assault, and I'm glad that the government is taking this approach. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I now call on Michael Matheson to wind up the debate till 4.59, Minister, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. Um, can I thank all the members for their contribution here this afternoon in what I think has been a very considered uh, debate, and there has obviously been a number of very thoughtful contributions made by uh, members over the course of uh, this afternoon's uh, consideration, um, which is also reflective of the content of the uh, Justice Committee's uh, report and the areas which they have given uh, due consideration to. And I can confirm that the convener is correct uh, that I am uh, chewing over uh, as she put it, the recommendations and the points which were raised by uh, the committee in their stage one report. And I've uh, tried to provide as helpful response to that um, uh, in the limited time since we have received the committee's report and uh, between that and the stage one debate uh, to try and set out the government's views on a number of these particular uh, matters. Um, uh, clearly, in the uh, contributions which have been made here this afternoon, um, uh, members have uh, taken a, a uh, taking uh, views on a range of the different matters contained within the bill. And I want to maybe try and pick up on a few of those in uh, the time which is uh, available to me. Uh, clearly, there is an issue uh, that the committee, some members of the committee had around the uh, uh, provision for mandatory uh, jury directions. In saying that, I recognise that it's uh, two members of the committee, the majority, clear majority of the committee, support 
the provision of uh, jury directions for the reasons which the Government have set out and which a range of stakeholders have set out, which is a point I wish to correct uh, Ms Goldie on when she raised the point she said that stakeholders had raised concerns. Some stakeholders have raised concerns. A range of other stakeholders are very supportive of the introduction of jury directions uh, as well. And I also want to take up the point which was raised by Margaret Mitchell uh, and which was also echoed to some degree by uh, Christine Graham on that they would prefer to wait for research to be conducted into the whole issue of jury directions before, uh, before we were to make these particular provision, provisions. As I set out in my opening comments, the reasons for taking forward jury directions is on the basis of we already have evidence around ill-conceived ideas and views that jury members may have and how that can have a bearing on their judgment of evidence which is led within a particular trial. Evidence has already been gathered on that particular area and there's also been some research in England into this particular area. So we do already have a body of research in this matter. The jury research which we are undertaking uh, in Scotland is about the provisions around post uh, post-abolition of corroboration and some of the measures which will be required around that, which are specific to the Scottish system. And can I also make this particular point, is that the last time I was here uh, uh, dealing with a piece of legislation, it was in relation to the Criminal Justice Bill. And at that particular point, Margaret Mitchell brought forward an amendment in order to introduce a new provision into our courts to deal with medical evidence being led in particular trials and the right of legal representations by another. And I set out the reasons for us not supporting that was on the basis that we are undertaking some research into that matter to identify how effective the existing provisions are operating around section 274 and 275. But the member chose to ignore that particular aspect of this. And despite that, this is a provision which is supported by the very organisations that Margaret Mitchell said we should have been listening to in the Criminal Justice Bill, Rape Crisis Scotland, etc., who are very supportive of the jury direction. So I do think there is an issue about the consistency of the approach that the, the, the Conservative Party have around some of these particular matters. But I am very grateful for the broad support that has been provided by others uh, around the provision of jury directions for the very purposes which I have set out around tackling issues around uh, preconceived and ill-founded attitudes about sexual offences that are committed and how victims should react to those matters and how that can cloud uh, a jury's uh, considered evidence on these issues. And I want to turn, uh, sign off, sir, to the issue around the uh, sharing um, of intimate images or revenge porn, as some members have referred to here this afternoon. Um, I've got no doubt that with the advances in technology, which all members will be aware of, that this is increasingly uh, an issue which is, uh, which is finding its way into our criminal justice system. And by providing a very specific uh, offence uh, set out in this legislation, it will help to support uh, our police and our law enforcement agencies and also support victims in making sure that these types of offences can be effectively addressed. I have heard the views that have been expressed by some stakeholders that we should look at extending this particular offence to include issues around audio files uh, and also in written word. And I know Margaret McDougall raised the issue, uh, Malcolm Chisholm raised the matter as well. However, as I have set out to the committee in my evidence, is that there are some challenges around extending it too far in terms of the lack of clarity it could then provide, particularly to our prosecutors, in being able to bring these matters before the court, an issue which was raised by, uh, highlighted by Alison McInnes in her own contribution. But as I have said to the committee, I will consider where there is a way in which we can do that without potentially compromising the intention behind this very specific offence which has been created within this particular uh, bill to ensure that we continue to have the clarity which is necessary in order to deliver the intentions behind this particular uh, provision. Uh, a number of members have also raised the issue around the potential uh, uh, unintended consequences of extending it further as well, particularly for young people around sexting and how that could end up criminalising many young people and bring them into a criminal justice system in a way in which this piece of legislation is not intended to. Hence why the issue around uh, providing education and information around this matter 
is an issue which we will give further consideration to. Guidance has already been issued to local authorities around this matter to provide directions to schools and education authorities and how they should deal with some of these matters in educating young people around the risks associated with this type of behaviour. But we will, of course, uh, give further consideration to these matters in, uh, as we progress with this uh, legislation. Officer, the other points which have been raised by members around the use of non-harassment orders, I thought, uh, were very well articulated uh, by Malcolm Chisholm uh, and some of the very specific cases uh, which have occurred where there has been a lack of protection from victims uh, from harassment by in certain individuals because of the deficiency within our criminal justice system at the present moment. The specific intention behind the provisions that we have put into this bill is to address exactly the point that was being raised and the example that was raised by Malcolm Chisholm set out very clearly here this afternoon. I understand some of the concerns that committee members have got about the practicality of its application, but I am absolutely no doubt by the creation of these additional measures around non-harassment orders, it will give greater clarity, in particular to the police, and when they should intervene and when they've got the authority to inter intervene in particular cases and provide reassurance to those victims that there is clarity around it, the police have uh, been able to intervene in these matters. Jim Austin, join my remarks to a close. I am again very grateful for all the contributions this afternoon, and I am grateful for the support that the committee and the other parties have offered at this stage one in considering this particular piece of legislation. And I will, of course, uh, look to work constructively with all members in considering what further improvements can be made to this legislation between now and the stage two process. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate on the abuse of behaviour and sexual harm Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of motion, motion number 14926 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the abuse of behaviour and sexual harm Scotland Bill. I call on John Swinney to move the motion. Deputy First yeah, Minister. Move, sorry, sir. Question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 15440, in the name of Paul Peelhouse, on Succession Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the Succession Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> the next question is that motion number 15441, in the name of Michael Matheson, on the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 14926, in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the abuse of behaviour and sexual harm Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting. <laughs> <laughs>